Library Board of Trustees, Southern California Logistics Rail Authority, Southern California Logistics Airport Authority, Victorville Redevelopment Agency, the Victorville Joint Powers Financing Authority, and the Victorville Water District. Uh, before we move into closed session, we do have public comment. I do have uh, two cards, and I'll start with Scott Tucker. Thank you, Mayor and Councilman. I'm Scott Tucker, President of Commercial Aviation Services, uh, a.k.a. Comal. Microphone Lift up. the microphone up. Uh, yes, and I'm here. Um, I'd like to uh, cede my time over to uh, Craig Garrick, Jr., also with Comaf. That's Thank you. Craig Garrick, Jr. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. We um, wanted to just uh, give a little bit of background on the proposal that is before you tonight on the uh, lease of Hangar 681 out at Southern California Logistics Airport. Um, there are two competing proposals as we have it. I want to give you a little background on COMAV quickly, what it is and, and who we are and why we're doing what we're doing. In 1999, we formed a company here called Southern California Aviation. It, uh, when it came, had zero employees, no customers, and no aircraft here. Since then, we have now have a little over 250 employees. We manage about 220 aircraft, and we have over 100 active customers that range between owners, operators, and uh, airlines themselves. Our customers, uh, Southern California Aviation was designed to do light transitional maintenance. It was not designed to do any sort of heavy maintenance to assist the customers as it transitions from one owner to another. As part of those services, uh, there's a lot of other things that go along with it, which are probably a subject of a different discussion, but because of those strategic plays, in 2002, Pratt & Whitney, uh, through their United, Te or United Technologies, through their Pratt & Whitney division, uh, bought an interest in Southern California Aviation, and today um, they own 51%, and AAC still owns 49% of that company. Our customers have requested repeatedly uh, over the last few years to expand our service base at Southern California Aviation to include heavy maintenance. Most of the aircraft we manage must go through a heavy maintenance repair cycle before they can be activated again. Uh, this maintenance is uh, labor business, and uh, for a large company with large overheads, it's very expensive. Pratt & Whitney did an internal analysis as our partner on SCA, and they passed on doing heavy maintenance, realizing that with their overheads as they were, they could not do it in a cost-effective manner. Uh, AAC, the company that is based here and founded by my father and now myself and Scott are helping to run it, um, we can do heavy maintenance and we can do it at a cost-effective rate that's competitive around the world. Uh, so we formed Commercial Aviation Services uh, to, a, to go after this opportunity. So ComAv, as it stands now, is in need of a hangar. It needs a hangar to start this business, uh, to start doing heavy maintenance, and to accommodate some of our other needs. Our customers range between Cathay Pacific, Boeing, FedEx, um, all the major leasing companies, most banks, and nearly every airline. Uh, these airlines, in, their, in the course of their events, need, need this type of, of heavy maintenance work. Uh, one of the customers, our primary customers, Federal Express, has a need for immediate 777 maintenance requirement uh, to do work on their brand new 777s. Comav has bid on this contract. Um, in addition to that, one hangar is not enough, and Comav is exploring right now with the Economic Development Authority, both federal, state, and local here in the county, to build a six wide body hangar complex out at the airport um, and to, be, to begin this process. That we believe will take about 18 months to complete from this point uh, based on where we are with the architects. Once that is completed and we start to fill it with contracts from our own customers that we already have, we will begin to employ 2,500 to 3,000 new jobs at Southern California Logistics Airport. Our operations are currently one eight-hour shift. They will go to three eight-hour shifts a day to a 24-7 operation as the aircraft there will be revenue aircraft needing to get back in the skies to make money. What we need initially is we need a hangar to start. FedEx's 777 program begins January 1st, 2012. That's in a very few short months. We don't have it secured yet. We have bid on it competitively with others, but currently we're managing 16 contracts for FedEx across the AAC companies, and each one of those is with a different division. We're well vetted, we're well liked, and our business continues to grow with FedEx. We feel very confident we have a likelihood of attaining that one. In addition, 
uh, ComAv has a sublease drafted and ready to sign with FedEx to keep the Northrop Grumman FedEx missile defense program that was displaced by the lawsuit with Leading Edge here in Victorville. Currently, all that material is sitting behind our building in six 55-foot semi-trailers awaiting the decision that we have tonight to get this hangar uh, so that we can begin the process of reinstalling and getting them back to work. Uh, should that not happen tonight um, or in the course of events, uh, ComAv not be successful in securing the hangar, that program will leave to Kansas City, and that is a permanent decision. So we'd like to keep that one here. In addition, we still own half of Southern California Aviation. What we propose is that we put the lease in ComAv's name. Commercial Aviation Services does not need the hangar until the first of this next year. Um, but in the meantime, FedEx and SCA will have on and off again requirements for the hangar, the reason that, hence the reason that Pratt & Whitney through its SCA division or through its SCA partnership has had the hangar in the past. We know that we can share equally among all these uh, interested parties in the hangar and bring about a situation where everyone can benefit from the one hangar that's there. We, have, we own half of SCA. We have a vested interest to make sure that works. We own all of ComAv. We have a vested interest to make sure that works. We are our largest customer is FedEx and our partner. We have an interest to see that work. In addition to the hangar itself, we've already have bids to build a temporary hangar facility just next to the existing one on tarmac that already exists. We intend to do that at our own expense, at our own cost, to create an overflow while the hangar complex is being built so that if there is a need where more than one party need the hangar at a time, we can fill it. Pratt & Whitney, the competitor for this lease, um, has no interest in ComAv, and uh, FedEx has decided to not do business with them on a sublease basis. So the choices that we have tonight are between ComAv and Pratt and & Whitney. One keeps the status quo. The other opens the, op the door to keep FedEx's missile defense program here, which in the future will become very, very important. Allows ComAv to begin creating jobs, we believe 300 at least this year, uh, with the, the awarding of that 777 contract. And allows us to keep SCA's requirements met um, for the on-again, off-again needs they have at a, with the hangar. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the council has received via email as well as has been placed before you on the dais an email from Aaron Korn. Um, I'm not going to have this read into the record, but it is provided to the entire council, which makes it public, so you all have that for your uh, perusal and discretion. This time we'll move into closed session, seeing no other public comment. Uh, I'll have our city attorney address our closed session items. Thank you, Mayor McCochran. We have... Um Ten closed session items. However, staff is requesting that we pull item eight. We do not need to go into closed session on item number eight. Uh, item number two is real property negotiations pursuant to government code 54956.8. Items three through seven pertain to existing litigation, and the parties to that litigation as well as the case numbers are all set forth on the agenda. Item number nine is a uh, real estate negotiations pursuant to government code 54956.8. Again, the parties pertaining to the and the properties affected are listed on the agenda. Item 10 is also existing litigation uh, in the matter of regional center, the USCIS case file. And lastly, we have one pursuant to government code 54957B, plenty of public employment city manager. Uh, to the extent there is reportable action, we will report any of that uh, reportable action either at the conclusion of the closed session or immediately prior to the commencement of the 7 o'clock meeting. All right, we'll now move into closed session. In the City Council sitting is the Library Board of Trustees, Southern California Logistics Rail Authority, Southern California Logistics Airport Authority, Victorville Redevelopment Agency, the Victorville Joint Powers Financing Authority, and the Victorville Water District. Our first item will have closed session announcements, and our city attorney, Mr. D. Bordnowski, will announce those. Thank you, Mayor McCochran. There are two reportable actions with respect to the closed session items, specifically with respect to item number 10 and 11. With respect to item number 10, the council this evening voted to initiate litigation uh, against the, uh, this is in connection with the EB-5 program to initiate litigation against uh, the federal government, specifically the defendants will be the Department of Homeland Security, the United States Citizens and Immigration Service, Janet Napolitano as Secretary of Homeland Security, Alejandro Mayorkas as Director of the USCIS, and Rosemarie Melville as Director of the California Service Center, 
This will be a complaint for declaratory relief and injunctive relief. It will be filed in um, the U.S. District Court, District of Columbia, on behalf of the City of Victorville and the RCVD. Let's hope that we will get this filed before the uh, end of the week. The vote in connection with that this evening was three to one. However, I should report with, with Ms. Vias uh, voting no and Ms. Uh, Councilmember Cabrialis being absent. Uh, the council previously on June 7th uh, initiated or agreed to and voted for one with uh, and the council member Vias opposed uh, on the 7th to actually uh, look into initiating that litigation. So that will that's a reportable action on item number 10. With respect to item number 11, um, there is two reportable actions. The first is that the city on a 4-0 vote agreed to accept the resignation of the current city manager, Jim, Jim Cox, uh, effective at the end of this month, and on a 3-1 vote uh, agreed to enter into a contract with Doug Robertson, uh, the contract to be a three-year contract. Uh, the first year compensation would be for $200,000 with it going to $225,000, assuming there are no other budget cuts or constraints uh, in year two. The vote, uh, if I didn't already report it, was 3-1 with Council Member Vias voting no and with uh, Council Member Cabrialis being absent. That is the reportable action. All right, this time we'll have our invocation and Pledge of Allegiance. Our invocation will be led by Bishop Moyon E. Iongi e and uh, our, from the Togan Congregation of the LDS Church. And our Pledge of Allegiance will be our, by our Police Chief, uh, Don Yoder. Our most kindly Heavenly Father, we come before Thee at this time for the privilege of this meeting. We thank Thee and we extended our love and privilege for the opportunity to conduct this meeting. We thank Thee that we have our freedom and peace in this country. We pray that we continue to live in peace we pray as we direct this agenda on this meeting this evening that your spirit will be abide with us on every issue that we're going to talk about tonight. It will be benefits for the community and all of us. Please bless everybody here. We have the equal in one mind. We put together all the ideas that will be benefit for all the people who live in this area. We humbly say this in Jesus Christ. Amen. We have a few presentations tonight, and we have a military banner certificate to the family of Zach Lara, United States Marine, graduated from Victor Valley High School in 2009, and here to accept on his behalf is his mom, Rachel. If I could have Rachel come forward. Good evening, everybody. My name is Rachel Lara Carranza. I'm Zach's mother, and um, I have something I'd like to read to you guys, um, hopefully make your evening. Um, about three months ago, I was approached by Colonel Diaz, and he was telling me about the program here uh, with the flags and to get a hold of Monica Peterson. So I did, and uh, lo and behold, this is where we're at, and here's a flag, and now I get a brag about my son. <laughs> When I was 29 years old and uh, 
I was told I was going to have another child. I didn't expect it, but I prayed, okay, God, let it be a little boy. Uh, when he was born, something leaped inside of me and said, this kid is going to be something special. I just knew it. So I named him Zach. Most people would spell Zach Z-A-C-H, not me. I spelled it Z-A-K. The reason I did that is because uh, I knew he would be standing, he would stand out among his peers. I just knew it. I had a gut feeling about this child. Um, Zach started out at Parkville um, Elementary here in Victorville, and he did well in elementary school. Then um, when he got transferred over to Irwin, he met a teacher there by the name of Miss Fredericks. Miss Fredericks introduced him to history, taught him um, a whole lot about the Civil War, different wars. And before you know it, Zach was uh, in the reenactments there at Irwin Elementary. The kid was sewing, making props, doing it all. He was just involved in everything. I should have had a clue back then that he was going to be a military person. <laughs> it didn't hit me then. Um, by the time he was in junior high, he came home one day and he says, Mom, I met a man named Colonel Diaz. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he's telling me about this cadet program. And I said, okay. He said, I want to be a part of it. I said, welcome. Okay, let's do it. A couple weeks later, he comes home with this tan uniform and patches, and he tells me, Mom, Colonel Diaz says these have to be sewn on straight. And I said, eek, I don't sew. <laughs> so um, he says, it's okay, Mom. He says, I'll sew. You know, he, he sews. So uh, he did. From there on, it was nonstop for the kid. He um, finished junior high, went to high school. He was a tutor still for Irwin Elementary, um, football player, tennis player, but he didn't stop serving in the cadet corps. Uh, he got on the state staff, and he just kept excelling, excelling, and selling. We were at every Victorville parade to watch him, and it, it was really exciting because um, he has left, he leaves an impact on everybody. Uh, that kid meets. Um, at the parades, I'll never forget, the, about two years ago, we were at the parade and my grandchildren were with me. They don't call him Zach, they call him Uncle Jack. And they see him coming, they said, Mom, Mom, Grandma, and Mom, uh, here comes Uncle Jack. Get up, get up, there's a flag, put your hand on the heart. This is a four and five year old. You know, this is the impact my son has put on them, plus many others. Um, so anyways, he finished high school. Um, before he finished high school, uh, he was on the state staff, like I said, for the California Cadet Corps. He um, became a general, um, I'm sorry, colonel, colonel for the California Cadet Corps. Now, I don't know if you guys know this, but in the city of Victorville, the Victorville High School, I think, has only had two or three of them, and Zach has been one of them. Uh, this year, I've had the privilege to um, go and represent Zach at the 100th anniversary of the Cadet Corps. And um, you know what? He made me so proud. <laughs> that kid, I mean, I felt like I was, hey, something really special. I got to take a picture with the governor, and it was just an awesome event. The kid never stops amazing me. So during about his junior year in high school, he came to me and said, Mom, I want to join the military. And I said, eek, you know, okay. So, you know, I didn't put too much into it. He kept checking out different branches. And he came home and he says, I know which one. I'm going to be a Marine. And I, my heart sank. <laughs> um, because he was only 17 years old, I had to go and sign for him. So I remember going, me and him, and I'm reading all these papers, and I'm thinking, oh, my God, you know, what am I doing? <laughs> but you know what? This is his dream. This is his dream. So I had to keep remembering that. I signed the papers. When I walked out of that office, I cried. I said, okay, this was a crying of joy, but also of sadness. But this was Zach's dream. So anyways, he, um, let's see, he went into boot camp and um, March of this, uh, he was in training for about a year and a half. And March of this year, of the 18th of uh, this year, he uh, got deployed to Afghanistan, where he's currently at. Um, he's in the Helmand Providence. And he's in a small city uh, called Sangin. Um, they do many patrols out there. And I am just so very proud of him. One day when I did get a phone call from him, he told me, Mom, I'm living my dream. And I thank God for giving me the strength to let him live his dream because who wants to send their son or daughter to war? Nobody. But you know what? I am happy in my heart because he's doing what he wants to do, and that's serve his country. If I could have a few more minutes, I'd like to read something that Zach wrote before he left. Is that okay? Yes. 
Okay. Um, this is what he wrote. So everyone, I did it. I enlisted in the Marines. You know, people join for many different reasons. Some join to, for the steady pay, some join for college money, some join because they just have nothing else to do with their life. Me, I joined because I felt it was my patriotic duty to serve my country, and that's where I want to begin my life. Society today, it's all talk. Anyone at any moment can say what needs to be done and how this and how they wish we could do something about it. But most won't do anything. So many kids today can talk the talk but not walk the walk. They are just sit back they are just backroom chatter men who will never understand what it means. Well I believe JFK sums it up the best. Ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. I signed in as an 0311 infantry. Why? Not because I'm a com complete dummy and I scored low on the ASVAT, but because I am very smart and I scored high on the ASVAT. But because it was where I felt I could truly make a difference and be on the ground where the action is and be the guy where national policy needs to be execute, executed, executed. <laughs> no offense to any of the military people, but I don't want to be in the rear with the gear, per se. And you know, I, hung, I have hung around with a lot of military people from all services and all kinds of military jobs. But when I talk to guys from the infantry, it's just a whole different kind of brotherhood, a brotherhood I want to be a part of. You know, one of the things I hate the most is when everybody comes up to me telling me, you know, what is infantry going to offer you after the military? Nothing, Zach. You know, well, it's my life. Let me worry about that stuff. I'll worry about that and cross that bridge when it comes. I live for today. I try not to think, think too far in advance, just enough to get me by. Then you get the people who um, call you friends who are totally anti-American, anti-military, and they annoy me. Freedom has a taste the free will never know. They know uh, they don't know and will never understand the vast amount of blood and sacrifice that has been spilled in order to preserve freedom. I feel proud to say in time I'm going to take part in an undertaking that this country deems important and where this and where there is willing where they are willing to send our military into harm's way and to accomplish the mission. I hate the blame American first crowd who sit around all day blaming Americans for every wrong in the world before going to sleep at night under the blanket of the freedom provide, provided by our military. With every person it's different. Their reasons for joining are often complex and deep personal and deep personal as mine was. Um, sometimes people ask me, so Zach, why did you join the Marines? Sometimes I can't answer or give a clear um, or give a clear answer, but then sometimes my, re my reply is because someone has to preserve freedom. I feel everyone should join the military in my eyes. I feel enlisting was my patriotic duty, as should be everyone. Finally, I'm darn proud to be an American. I'll never apologize for being one. I was born an American, I will live an American, and I will die an American. That's my story. I just want to say to my son, if he's watching now, that I love him, and I'm so proud of him. And I want to thank you guys for the program, because uh, this is really what it's all about. Thank you. Yes, and that banner will fly uh, over our city until your son gets back, and then we will present it to him at that time. So uh, you'll be seeing that hung here uh, very, very shortly. All right, at this time we'll have our uh, uh, Public Works Day uh, essay contest winners, and Ro Ratliff, she's going to come up and help me present those. Good evening. Um, I'm Ro Ratliff. I work uh, for the Public Works Department. Um, and this year I had the great opportunity to coordinate the Public Works Day event for the Victor Elementary uh, School District students. Um, on June 2nd, um, this uh, event took place 
and the Public Works Department hosted a field trip for 300 fourth grade students from several schools in our area. This special event enabled the students to learn how the Public Works Department contributes to the quality of life in Victorville. Our goal was to educate the students about public works by providing an, infra or an instructive outreach program that would broaden their civic knowledge and understanding of the public works infrastructure. The essays that the students were invited to write about their experience showed that we did indeed accomplish our goal. On behalf of the City of Victorville, I would like to take the opportunity to thank first Victor Elementary School District, especially Melissa Timko Miller for coordinating individual school teacher and student participation. Second, I want to thank our Public Works uh, water and engineering staff for their professional event presentations. Third, I want to thank our awesome mayor for attending Public Works Day and for presenting these awards tonight. Um, but last, last but not least, um, our sponsors. We want to thank them. Dr. Renilda P. Valencia, MD, GDQ Attorneys at Law, Safeway Sign Company, Sheer Realty, Sherwin-Williams, the City of Victorville Recycling Program, and Victor Valley Transit Authority. The event was a wonderful success, largely due to our sponsors' thoughtful contributions. Their generosity helped provide the Orange Junior Public Works t-shirts that were given to each student, as well as the prizes that are being awarded to the top three essay finalists tonight. And you can see all the kids up there in that picture. Um, they were so excited to be a Junior Public Works uh, day worker. <laughs> um, and I also wanted to thank the parents for making it possible for your child to attend uh, tonight to receive their award. It means so much to us that they're here. And uh, at this time, we'd like to present the awards to them. Uh, they are our Public Works Day 2011 essay contest winners. Uh, students, when your names are called, please come up and we'll award you. Um, <clears throat> congratulations to our first place winner, receiving a $100 Barnes & Noble gift card. Uh, this student wrote an outstanding essay on the City of Victorville's proactive approach toward graffiti abatement from Delray School, Julissa Perez. Okay, congratulations to our second place winner, receiving a $50 Barnes & Noble gift card. This student wrote a winning essay on the City of Victorville's highly trained fleet division. Also from Delray School, Juan Orozco. Okay, and congratulations to our third place winner receiving a $25 Barnes & Noble gift card. This student wrote a creative and fun essay on how the City of Victorville Traffic Signal Division works to keep the public safe. From Challenger School, Ashley Smith. Thank you all for coming and we hope you have a great evening. Forgot to think that guy that was up there in the scaffolding taking that picture. He's probably 100 feet up. <laughs> Okay, at this time I'll have the city clerk present the agenda to the council and any revisions. Uh, the only revision that we have is on items number 21 and 27. There is additional information on the dais that has been provided by the staff regarding delinquency charges. That I'll present the agenda. The City Council of the City of Victorville welcomes the public's participation in tonight's meeting. It is requested that all present please silence cell phones, pagers, and other electronic devices, and that personal conversations be kept to a minimum during the conduct of the meeting. Persons who wish to address the Council on a specific item which appears on the agenda are requested to complete one of the white speaker cards that have been placed on the agenda table in the Council Chamber's lobby and give it to the City Clerk for the record prior to consideration of the item. 
The mayor will call upon each individual who has submitted a speaker card when the item comes up for discussion by the city council. The public comment period is the time and place for the general public to address the city council on any item within their jurisdiction that is not on the agenda. It is requested that a speaker card also be submitted to the city clerk for anyone who wishes to address the city council during the public comment period. Pursuant to government code section 54954.3, state law prohibits the council from addressing any issue not previously included on the agenda. The council may receive testimony and set the matter to a subsequent meeting. Comments are to be limited to three minutes per speaker or less as deemed necessary by the mayor, depending upon the number of individuals desiring to speak. All communications are to be addressed directly to the mayor. Individual comments to council members, staff, or members of the audience are not permitted. Individuals who fail to hit, adhere to these guidelines may be asked to yield the floor. Any individual or group who engages in disruptive conduct during the meeting will be removed from the chambers by order of the mayor. Disruptive conduct includes, but is not limited to, addressing the council without being recognized, not addressing the subject before the council, repetitiously addressing the same subject, failing to relinquish the podium when requested to do so, verbal outbursts or comments from the audience. Thank you for your cooperation and adherence to these rules. All documents to be considered for approval at this meeting are before the council. That's all I have, Mayor McEachran. All right, thank you. We'll go ahead and move into public comments. Uh, I do have several cards. We'll start off with Norm Miller. Mr. Mayor, Council Members, my name is Norman Miller. I'm the Chairman of the Golden Triangle Ad Hoc Committee. And I want to take this time to thank uh, everyone from the city manager, I hate to say down, through staff, but anybody that had anything to do with getting eucalyptus put through. There are council, or I'm sorry, ad hoc committee members, there are residents of the Golden Triangle, and there's residents of the southern part of the Golden Triangle that are very appreciative of this because they needed that street and they need the signal that's on 395. It's going to be great. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Miller, uh, Dorothy Miller. Dorothy Miller. Well, I have about two or three things I want to talk about. One is what happened to the frenzied audit? We never got any results. What happened to the grand jury? We got no results. What's going on? We have no idea. Then we get this big speech, what we cannot do. This is the people's house. This is not your house. It's the people's house. The council works for the people. You guys got to remember that. You're working for us, all the people in this city, not just one, everybody in this city. And some things that's been going on, we don't need them. We need to start thinking about what we're doing and who we're working for. And then another thing is all these people that's going to get laid off and this and this and this. You keep these people on such a turmoil, it's not even funny. And I think it stinks. And I'm going to tell you straight out exactly how I feel. And Mr. Mayor, there's two of you sitting up there. Like I say, I have your seats bought for you. Now what are we going to do when election comes again? Are we going to buy some more seats so these developers can do whatever they want to do, whenever they want to do it, and you guys are going to stick up for them? No, that's not right. And I feel you shouldn't be buying seats. I feel the person that's qualified for the job should be get the job, not just buying them. And you guys accepted the money. You guys are the ones that needs to pay. Thank you. Lieutenant Colonel Felix Diaz. By the way, the grand jury secretary has told me that the report will be out on June 30th, so be on the lookout for it. Good evening, members of the uh, city council and ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm here for really for two purposes, but the main reason I'm here is because uh, uh, 
I'm, I'm asking the city council to see if they can make a donation to the American GI Farm Education Foundation. We're having our 12th annual mariachi festival on uh, August the 20th, and uh, you have supported us in the past, and we support the flag program. And uh, what we do, and we don't get the publicity, but what we do is that we train our little children to dance, sing, play instruments, and then we go and, and we entertain the forgotten veterans of America. And those are the veterans of the Second World War, Korea and Vietnam, that are at the Barstow Veterans Home. We've been going there and entertaining these, yes, old people, and they truly appreciate it. That's what we use our money for, is to help them. We also contribute to the flag program. We also contribute to the Veterans Memorial. Uh, there's a lot of things that we do with our monies, and that's the only fundraiser that we have. So I'm going to leave this packet and see if you'd like to put an ad in our program. If that is not possible, then I would ask if uh, uh, the city council would okay uh, putting a, an, an ad in the, on the marquee here on the freeway and giving us that kind of publicity because we need, we need the money. We need the, to have some publicity. And the last and final thing that I'd like to say is that I'm so proud of Zach Lara. Uh, as Mrs. Lara was saying, uh, there have been three that have come out of Victor Valley High School. There's actually five that have came out of Victor Valley High School that were assigned to the state program. Uh, Zach was one of them and uh, uh, four others. And I'm proud to say that they all went through my program. I am so proud of these kids because they're my kids. They're my kids too. And yes, we wear the Boy Scout uniform, but we do a lot of good for the community and we do a lot of good for our country. Thank you very much. Thank you. April Pinkston. Uh, hello, uh, Mayor and City Council. I, my name is April Pinkston, and I live on City Bowl in Victorville. And on May 17th, I came in and addressed the issue of the City of Victorville um, getting the same music ordinance as Hesperia, and I was just following up on that because um, on June 10th, there was quite a few music calls. Now, there were only 25. As a former dispatcher, when I call dispatch, they give me a lot of information, and they told me that there were 25 music calls that evening. Now, that doesn't sound like an awful lot for the city it, this size. However, it took three hours for the deputies to respond, and it's very, very frustrating. And I would like the city once again to adopt that the city is the victim as opposed to um, me because I don't want to have to fear retaliation from my neighbors and I want to be able to enjoy my property and sit in my yard without um, listening to someone else's choice in music. Now that being said, there's a couple other issues that I would like to address. Um, I will plead ignorance about what's going on in the city of Victorville because I am a new resident of Victorville. I have just recently uh, gotten involved in the city politics and reading the paper and reading various comments. And as I shop around in town, because I'm not at all shy, I'm very assertive, and I talk to people in this town and I read the paper and when I go to the restaurants and I go to my workplace, I talk to the people and it's the general consensus is that everybody is in Angela's corner and everybody feels like the rest of... Um, the city council is, you know, just acting in their best interest and not in the best interest of the city of Victorville. That being said, Mayor, I have talked to you at great length on the phone, and I greatly appreciate the time that you took to talk to me. And I do, at this point, have a great deal of respect for you, and I also told you that I feel that any time that there's a problem or a disagreement, that it should be handled professionally. And I am here to tell you right now, very professionally, that I was very disappointed when I read the article that you are accusing Ms. Baez of conflict of interest. Now, I really don't know what's going on there, okay? But it is my impression that Angela is a very nice young lady, and she's also a graduate of Azusa Pacific College, and she's well-educated and able to write letters like that. 
And it seems to me that you guys are a team. You're supposed to be working together for the betterment of the city and not going against each other. And as a former military person, I know what it's like to be the only female in a squadron. And you guys are supposed to be acting as a team, not cutting each other's throats, okay, and trying to make each other look bad. And I would appreciate it, you know, if you guys would just reconsider what's going on. And the election's going to be coming up soon. And at this point, Mayor, I would be proud to vote for you again, okay, because I have a great deal of respect for you. And I want to keep it that way. The okay. last Ms. issue, Pinks, you know, if you could wrap it up because the okay. three minutes is up. The last issue that I wanted to bring up was that the last time that I was here, I found out that the city of Victorville had spent money on the celebration of Cinco de Mayo. Now, I was greatly disappointed at that because the simple fact is, is that it has nothing to do with our city is floundering for finances and it has nothing to do with us. Cinco de Mayo is a celebration of independence from, of Mexico from Spain. That, to me, makes as much sense as spending money or for England celebrating the 4th of July. And so I would like you guys to reconsider what you're doing with the city's money, okay? Because I'm a property owner and a taxpayer, and I would like you to reconsider that. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Please keep an eye out on that noise ordinance. That will be coming back. The noise ordinance will be coming back before us at some point in the near future. Uh, Raymond Herrera. Raymond. Raymond. I'm hearing impaired and I don't have my hearing aids with me. Okay. Um, good evening, Mayor. My name is Raymond Herrera with People, California's Crusader. I am a political activist that fights on behalf of America against illegal aliens and other issues. Uh, I'm now taking up the cause of the city of Victorville. I am a resident, your constituent, and I'm very dissatisfied with how the city council's run. And be point blank with you, it's you, 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 and him against the voice, the will, and the mandate of the people, Angela Valles. You, you do everything to stop her, impede her progress. The people want to see Angela perform. We're tired of the status quo. For those of you that are coming up for election, I'm going to make sure that you're voted out of office. Ask Felix Diaz. He got him voted out. And, Mayor, I've been to more city councils than you have days alive on earth. Thousands of them. You cannot prevent me from speaking to Rudy, to Jim, to Mike. It's freedom of speech and it's, you know, the right to seek redress from the body politic. So, I mean, your intentions are misdirected. You're trying to cover up for all the corruption that went on before you became mayor. Rudy afforded the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce $80,000 in donations from the city of Victorville, as far as I could see, as far as I read in four years' time after we married Vicky. That's corruption. That's immoral. And right here is the body politic that sat with it. Mr. Rothschild presented a $20,000 check. We don't have that kind of money in the city of Victorville. Good times, bad times. But what I find even more interesting is uh, that the Chamber of Commerce, how much did you give them? How much did you give the tribal African Chamber of Commerce? Is it just Hispanics that you give money to? Is it you trying to curry favor with Latinos or Hispanics? And this thing about a donation for mariachis, you know, and all that good stuff, I wouldn't give them a dime. American warriors deserve better than a racist event. Now, what I'm really here to talk about today is E-Verify. It's coming down the pipe. I've worked hard with the congressional leaders in Washington, D.C., and I can assure you, look out. I'm asking you, Mayor, to mandate that every worker in the city of Victorville be E-Verified. You, this city council, will put an ordinance out there. That you don't work in Victorville unless you're E-Verified. These jobs belong to us and not to illegal aliens. You are vested with the power to protect the constituents of Victorville, the Commonwealth of Victorville. I expect you to do that. You verify it's coming. I've worked with the unions to make sure that it comes. I've worked with congressional leaders to make sure that it arrives. It's here. Join we the people. Stand up for America. Thank you, Mr. Ferrer. It's EB5. 
I don't agree with that either, Mayor. I, as I told you people before, you don't sell out American citizenship for a dollar. Then you pay bad loans that were made by Rudy when he was mayor. Anyway, Mayor, I, I really like you. I think you're a good guy, but I think that you've been listening to the wrong people. And Angela, God bless you for everything that you've done for the people of Victorville, and we look forward to having you do a lot more. God bless, Mayor. God bless. Thank you. Angela. Robin Haviston. Um, I would just like to briefly talk about three things. Number one, uh, the item 10 that was talked about, I believe uh, suing Homeland Security, um, from what I understood in the presentation, um, related to the E5 issue. Every person I've talked to is against, was against the E B5 visa from the get-go. And I believe the one dissenting vote most likely represents the will of the people of Victorville. And then secondly, I would just like to also camp off on the investigation that's been going on with the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. I've been following it closely in the newspaper and I appreciate so much the newspaper coverage. And to me, it looks like it's just about accountability. So I hope that it goes forward and I look forward to reading more about it in the newspaper. And then third, uh, just to camp off on what Mr. Herrera said on E-Verify, that's a Department of Homeland Security program where employers can call in to uh, determine the legal status of a new hire. And I just bought an article um, recently. The Supreme Court ruled in the favor of the state of Arizona for their law, their state law demanding E-Verify. Uh, we feel like that's a landmark decision that's uh, uh, at the local level. We also have had many cities in Southern California, Hammett for one, um, Temecula, that have enacted uh, municipal E-Verify ordinances. And we'd like for this city to look at doing that. Uh, one issue you have in Victorville is the day labor site at Home Depot. Mr. Herrera gets many complaints from citizens at, about the day laborers at the Home Depot. Uh, just last weekend, a young man with his fiance uh, contacted Mr. Herrera because he said his fiance uh, was approached in um, a very untoward manner by the day laborers at Home Depot, and he asked Mr. Herrera to do something. Uh, we feel like if you had an E-Verify ordinance or different types of ordinances, you could address issues like this in Victorville. Thank you. Thank you. Rebecca Rimbaugh. My name is Rebecca Rimbach. I'm the former manager of High Desert Gardens of Long Care Landscaping. We are the company that you let go last year, September 2010, and hired a company off the hill to do the work, the LMAD works, the LMADs and the MADs because they did it cheaper, but it's funny, you guys just approved another $44,000 for them to have last month, if you look. Um, I'm here because there's no bids. You said in June there's a bid going out for other companies to bid on the LMADs, and I haven't seen anything yet. Today on the agenda, you're supposed to be approving the budget, which is no different from last year, which is kind of funny because the companies that are working, two companies off the hill, by the way, not any companies up in the high desert, not the companies people who live here and pay the taxes and whatnot, which is ironic to me. Um, I, I would like to know if it's going to be going out to bid. I would like to know what's going on. Um, I don't think it's right that two companies off the hill have it. I also think that the bidding process is very biased, but that's just an opinion. And I am here to pretty much let you know that I have statements from other companies, a company that's actually went out of business because you pretty much got rid of us in nine days and hired a company off the hill. But once again, that's what it is. I would like to keep businesses up here in Victorville. Once again, it starts in Victorville. I don't understand why we're not keeping businesses up here. We, I, two businesses off the hill that you're paying more than $200,000 to do your assessments, and we can do it. One company where I have five families who own homes in Victorville, own them and pay taxes that pay your paycheck, and I don't understand why we're still doing that. Well, we can do it for the same price. Once again, it looks like they're doing it for cheaper, but you're approving 
more and more for each time. So I'm just here I'd like to know when the bid process is going out because I was told if you look back in September 2010, that's why you got rid of us so you can put it on contract. And I'd like to know when that's going to be doing it so my company has a fair chance to do that. And thank you. And Angela, I'd like to thank you for everything you've done and listening to the people. You've done a great job. Thank you for your time. <clears throat> Jonathan Vanderloop. Jonathan Vanderloop. Gentlemen and uh, uh, fellow citizens of Victorville and the Valley, uh, I'm here with the uh, Youth Activities Association of Victorville, and I'm speaking in the public comment here because uh, we've asked people who support the uh, continued operation of the West Wind Sports uh, Center to wear white tonight. Um, even if they don't speak. So just about everybody that's here in white is here for the West Winds, which is a much later item, and hopefully they can s stick around uh, for that item. But I wanted to read briefly something that was in the newspaper. Newspaper today that caught my eye. It says here, I didn't even know West Winds had a sports center. I bet if more people knew about it, they might use the facilities. Spend the money on activities to keep kids and young adults busy and save money on supporting them in jail. So uh, this caught me as uh, exactly what you guys were attempting to do by shutting down the West Winds. We're trying to um, keep it open, and we've uh, formed a group, which we'll discuss later on item 32, the uh, particulars of it. But basically, we want to maintain and expand the youth activities at the West Winds Sports Center, draw on the old American spirit of volunteerism, to reduce costs, sell memberships, and seek donations. And we seek the support of uh, volunteer time, donations from civic organizations, foundations, businesses, clubs, churches, individuals, etc., to make the West Winds operation uh, revenue neutral to the city of Victorville. So I understand that uh, you're doing the same thing with the golf course, but you have six years that you hope to make it revenue neutral. And you've uh, lost over a million dollars last year which would keep the West Winds open for a couple of lifetimes. Uh, so <clears throat> um, I would like to uh, strongly urge you to um, keep the West Winds open, and, and uh, we will uh, discuss this when the item 32 comes up. Thank you. OK. I do have several other cards, but they are related to the budget. Anyone else wishing to address the council under public comment? All right, with that, we'll move into our public hearings. Um, and I'm going to take uh, the budget for all agencies at the same time, although we may choose to vote on them separately. I would like a presentation from staff on the budget for the Library Board of Trustees, Southern California Logistics Airport Authority, the Redevelopment Agency, and Victorville Water District in the city of Victorville. Mayor McEachran, just for the record, there was one additional public comment uh, that has been provided to the city council for the record from Mr. Dan Tate. Uh, correct, and that there was a request to read that in the public uh, record, but uh, we're not going to be doing that, as I indicated in uh, public comment before closed session. Uh, it has been provided to the entire council. It is a matter of public record. Uh, so with that, if we could have a presentation by staff on the budget. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm just waiting for IT to catch up and uh, get the presentation up on the up on the screens. Uh, this uh, budget is as a result of uh, the discussion that was had uh, uh, back in uh, April. Uh, let's see, here it comes. Um, and uh, we took into account the comments that were made by the council and uh, comments that were made by the public. Um, in order to uh, present a balanced budge budget to the uh, City Council today. Um, I do need to thank uh, hundreds of people, really. I can't name all of them, but uh, just uh, as a matter of uh, information, um, the way our budget is put together, uh, each department head tasks his or her um, department managers and staff to put together uh, a budget based on the priorities of the Council and based on the estimated uh, expenditure, or excuse me, estimated revenues that we uh, are expecting for next year. Um, that then rolls up and is submitted to finance, and uh, typically a team 
of folks in finance then put that together uh, to in order to come up with the, the total expenditure amount that's being requested and then we work with each department uh, throughout the spring really to uh, to make all of those budgets equal uh, equal the revenues uh, uh, so I want to thank uh, everyone who was involved in that process uh, and especially uh, Francine Millinder uh, who is uh, an analyst in finance who uh, in years past has had quite a bit more help with the budget um, and uh, doing all of that rolling up and, and compiling all the budgets together um, this year because we're implementing the MUNIS program uh, the management uh, specialist who normally assists her with that was busy with that, so they were doing double duty, both of them, uh, in order to uh, to get both the budget together and also get the, the MUNIS project uh, ready for, for go live here next month. So, and Adam, my uh, clicker is not clicking, so I may have to make you, uh, there we go. Um, as has been the case for the past several years, the economy is, is still our biggest challenge. Uh, trying to balance those revenues, uh, the expenditures with the revenues. When uh, revenues really are, are remaining flat, we're kind of happy that they're remaining somewhat flat because uh, they had been uh, in a much steeper downward trend. Um, and we have been doing our best to maintain service levels with that reduced workforce that we've got. Um, on uh, April 19th, staff presented best and worst case scenarios uh, in order to bridge what was then projected to be an $8.4 million budget gap. Uh, in the general fund, that is our biggest area of concern. Um, most of the other budgets uh, are, are doing fine. Um, they uh, have had some reductions based on revenues, but it's a little easier to make those reductions and, and, and make those expenditures match the revenues. Um, what was proposed or what was uh, requested from all departments was an 8% cut that included police and fire. Uh, as a potential, as well as 100% use of our reserves. Uh, the council was not amenable to cutting the police and fire contracts. Uh, so we uh, made the change and went with the other option, which was a 29%, up to a 29% cut uh, to the remaining departments that are not police and fire. Um, we also took into account uh, your direction to go ahead and use the remainder of the reserves uh, available to us in order to try to uh, preserve as much service as we could. Um, we are uh, presenting this budget based on those priorities that you discussed at that meeting. I do want to thank the council actually. In, in years past, we haven't had nearly as much discussion. Uh, we're hopeful to have more in the future. Um, but we haven't had nearly as much discussion as we had back in April, so we appreciate that input. Um, we have preserved those public service levels in police and fire. Um, we are promoting economic growth where possible. We're trying to foster a quality of life with the revenues that we have. And for your direction, we're trying to conserve jobs and those levels of service uh, as much as is possible. Um, the police contract remains roughly the same. Um, we actually, upon using uh, the ability uh, or the direction to use that uh, that reserve, uh, this budget before you tonight actually funds two of the vacant positions uh, that appeared uh, in last year's budget. Um, at this point, we're not recommending direction to fill them, although the money is budgeted to do so. I'll get into that just a little bit more uh, in a uh, proceeding slide. Um, the city fire. Uh, contract remains uh, effectively the same. Uh, or co other core levels in public safety remain the same as well. Code enforcement, that was a big issue for the city council to maintain, as well as uh, animal control and at least the core levels of street sweeping. There is some minor trimming there, however, in street sweeping. Um, always an interesting slide to see our, our history of the percentage of police and fire to the, to the total general fund. As you can see, this reflects the council's uh, direction to preserve that public safety. Um, and to a certain degree, that does come at the expense of the remaining general fund departments. And that's a conscious decision of the council that uh, staff supports and is willing to continue uh, preserving those, uh, those important public safety items as directed. Um, I mentioned that there was two, uh, we had actually put in the budget enough funding for two public safety positions to uh, sheriff's deputy positions. Um, at this point, uh, right after doing that actually, and right after getting the vinyl budget uh, sort of put together, um, there was an article in the newspaper that indicated uh, some of the ongoing negotiations with the county safety contracts with their unions. And it does cause us some concern 
uh, although the, uh, the uh, firefighters have accepted the budget uh, concessions that were proposed by the CAO, uh, there hasn't been an agreement reached with the Sheriff's Department yet, and that does cause us some concern because if, in fact, they don't come to an agreement, not only would that affect the, uh, the Sheriff's contract, but also because of the Me Too clause or Me Too agreement as part of the fire contract, both the sheriff's contract and the fire contract would go up because uh, it's our understanding based on the reports in the newspaper that uh, the uh, firefighters acceptance of those budget concessions is contingent upon all the bargaining units for the county accepting concessions as well and if they don't then then they would uh, they would undo that that portion of their contract so um, it's something we would prefer to, to wait and see on as we get a little deeper into the fiscal year. Uh, but as I said, it is a budgeted item, and should the council wish to go ahead and fill those positions, the money is in the budget in order to do so. Uh, and uh, as I recall from, from uh, a few months ago, those positions could be filled within a matter of weeks. Uh, economic growth, uh, we'd like to have uh, more dollars available, but because of uh, property tax declines, we simply don't. Uh, we are still uh, funding uh, on the city side six million dollars towards the Lamesa and Nisqually interchange. Uh, Sandbag will oversee the project as uh, you entered into a contract with them, uh, or directed us to enter into a contract with them last month. Uh, but we do still have some right-of-way ac uh, acquisitions and some other uh, project work that needs to be done on the city side of that. Uh, we are budgeting just under a million dollars for the uh, wastewater treatment facility. Uh, in order to complete some sludge lines and some emergency bypass lines. Uh, programs that were preserved that are non-general fund items are, are listed there. I don't want to read every slide to you. Uh, we are doing our best to maintain those important uh, safety items uh, that uh, protect our, our citizens. Uh, other programs that were preserved that are in the general fund, uh, the uh, library, uh, staffing has been preserved. Um, there are a few program reductions. Uh, the library actually, although it is listed in the general fund, the library funding actually comes from uh, a specific call out in state law that gives them a small portion of property tax. Uh, for this year's budget, uh, the library is relying 100% on that small portion of property tax, as well as uh, some uh, movie rental programs and, and some other programs that they offer that do bring in a little bit of revenue, but there is no reliance on the general fund for the library this year. Uh, graffiti removal service remains the same. Uh, so the, the girl who won the award for, for writing the essay about our graffiti removal service is probably happy tonight to hear that. Uh, street sweeping, uh, we have uh, had to reduce that just a little bit for residential street sweeping, but other uh, major arterials and things remains unchanged. Uh, there was a threat uh, based on the potential for the worst case scenario budget that we might have to close seven parks. We have averted that. Those parks will remain open. Um, and uh, there are some service level reductions in, in our Parks and Recreation Division uh, as a result of some of the budget cuts. And we'll get into that a little bit later as well. Code enforcement current service levels are maintained uh, as directed by the City Council. Um, we have had to reduce. I do want to make it clear to the Council and to the public that no one on City staff wants to close any of these facilities. Uh, we make these recommendations based on trying to get to uh, recreational opportunities that are revenue neutral uh, and uh, still provide uh, as much recreation as we can based on, based on our budget. Um, this budget, uh, as proposed, uh, includes the closure of the Pebble Beach Racquetball Facility, West Winds Activity Center, West Winds Sports Center, and the West Winds Golf Course. Um, and also the potential closure of the Pebble Beach Pool following the summer swim season. Uh, we want to evaluate that as we get a little deeper into the next fiscal year, but not wait until next budget in order to make a proposal along those lines. Um, because if we can keep it open, we'll need to start recruiting for lifeguards and, and swim coaches and things uh, in, in early spring. So we would bring that back to you, assuming this budget passes tonight, sometime around uh, the mid-year point. Um, other uh, reductions are, are listed here. Um, again, we've got reduced service levels uh, throughout pretty much all of City Hall, uh, all counters uh, due to staffing reductions that have occurred throughout this fiscal year and will occur as a result of this budget. Um, looking at some of the, uh, the overall numbers for the city, 
um, some dramatic reductions in the budget based on revenues. Uh, the total city budget is just over $200 million as proposed, uh, down over $100 million from last year's budget. Um, current revenues uh, are down approximately $46 million. Uh, and then uh, the transfers in and fund balance reductions are down as well. Uh, expenditures are down uh, in order to match those uh, those revenue numbers. Um, tremendous uh, drop in CIP, the capital improvement program, as well as just the general operating. Uh, budget comparisons, I call this the mountain uh, slide. Uh, pretty dramatic change in our budget over the last uh, six fiscal years. Um, uh, going from a height in 09 of $568 million down to uh, $130 million uh, between the general fund and the CIP. Uh, as well as uh, all funds. Uh, operating revenues by type. Um, this is just a graphic depiction that will appear in the final um, budget. Uh, it's not something that appears in the proposed budget. Uh, and uh, like I said, it will be included in, in that final budget document once it's approved. Um, just gives you a, a little bit of an idea for revenues come, where revenues come from. And likewise on the expenditure side. Um, the special funds, uh, which is the largest category there, are things such as uh, uh, the water, water, sewer, uh, trash, uh, th those types of charges for services for the most part. Uh, the CIP, as I mentioned earlier, is down about $52 million. Uh, we do have uh, a little bit of activity there that's, that is listed. Um, I went over most of the major items uh, earlier in the presentation. Uh, our component units, uh, the water district is down $42 million. That is in large part uh, due to the wastewater uh, facility being uh, basically completed. Um, RDA is down significantly, uh, although that is more of an accounting issue than, than an actual revenue issue. Um, uh, and uh, as I mentioned, uh, SCLA is down, as well as the library has been reduced down to their actual funding level. Um, at this point, I'm actually going to pause uh, for just a little bit and ask uh, Keith Metzler to come up. Uh, the RDA budget is uh, based on uh, our, our current expectations for revenues. Um, there's been a lot of press uh, in the past about the governor potentially canceling RDAs in general. Um, and there has been some new developments since this presentation was put together that uh, we hope won't affect the budget, but potentially could. So I'll ask Mr. Metzler to go over those, those new developments. Uh, thank you, Mr. Robertson, uh, Mayor, and members of the council. Keith, would you put How about now? The uh, budget that we prepared is the Department of Economic Development largely comprises the redevelopment agency budget, and it is a balanced budget. And despite revenues being uh, trending downward uh, for the last few years now, uh, we have actually successfully managed uh, cash balances in the redevelopment agency project areas to where we've been able to at least cash flow through these uh, uh, difficult times. Uh, so the, ba the, the budget that will, uh, that's actually before you is balanced. It does rely on inter-fund borrowing uh, from other project areas. Um, also comprising the department's budget is the Southern California Logistics Airport Authority. Uh, and as that budget showed a large $36 million number as a total uh, budget, that actually gets broken down into three parts, the biggest part being your debt service, uh, which I'll speak to a little bit more particularly uh, concerning the legislation. Um, but as it relates to the operations of the airport, uh, I'm actually uh, pleased that the budget that we proposed just for the operations of the airport, that's on airport revenues, lease revenues, landing fees, uh, we're actually operating cash positive in the current year and we're actually projecting uh, cash positive operations in the next year. That's significant because that means uh, that the airport operations will not rely on uh, any city funds uh, as it had done in the past. Uh, as it relates to its debt service, it will rely on interfund lending from the RDA. The disclosure that I have to make is that the budget has been prepared absent what happened last week uh, in the legislature. Last week, the uh, legislature passed a budget uh, that had trailer bills. Uh, trailer bills contained uh, options to both eliminate redevelopment in its entirety or uh, create an option for redevelopment agencies to decide to continue to exist if they were to pay 
um, uh, a fee akin to the ERAF fee that we've been used to, to paying over the years. Uh, the legislative bills, even though, uh, backing up, even though the governor vetoed the budget, uh, the bills, the trailer bills uh, did not get vetoed with that action. Uh, so they still exist. As I understand, they just haven't been passed to the governor uh, for signature, but they have been approved both in the Senate and Assembly. Uh, those bills are ABX 126. That's the bill that just strictly eliminates the redevelopment agencies and ABX 127, and that's the bill that actually gives the option for RDAs to continue to exist. Uh, but there's the penalty over the next two fiscal years. Um, next year alone, the penalty to the RDA would be about $19.1 million, uh, and the 1213 projection is about $4.5 million. Um, if we chose to continue to exist and subject ourselves to that payment, and we actually made that payment, um, it is very likely that you would be forced to default on some of your debt service obligations. That's how dramatic uh, these bills are. Um, while they haven't been signed by the governor, uh, we've certainly urged uh, that the assembly withdraw. They're actually uh, sending those bills to, to the governor and consider reform as opposed to elimination, which has been our position as a redevelopment agency. Um, so with that, I wanted to make that disclosure because if, in fact, uh, those two bills do get approved, uh, it's going to really force us to retool uh, the budget that's before you tonight. Thank you, Mr. Metzler. Um, moving on now, uh, looking more closely at the general fund specifically, uh, current revenues are $44 million estimated. Uh, that's down uh, just over a million dollars. Uh, and we are using about $1.2 million in, in reserves uh, as directed by this council uh, back in April. Um, the expenditures uh, match that, uh, that total number there, and there are no CIP projects projected, uh, or excuse me, uh, budgeted uh, with general fund dollars. Uh, so the general fund is entirely operating. Uh, looking a little bit more closely at the general fund, this is the the, uh, the the smallest piece of that mountain slide I talked about earlier. And as you see, uh, at the height of our uh, budget, um, we were budgeting just over $66 million, and this year we are under $47 million. So we've had uh, nearly a one-third reduction in, in general fund budgeting uh, over the last uh, four budget years, including this upcoming year, and that has occurred with uh, no cuts to uh, police and fire contracts. Um, the reductions to the operating budgets uh, uh, for each department is, is up to 29%. Uh, as I mentioned, some of the areas that were preserved, such as code enforcement, uh, graffiti abatement and things, they didn't have cuts. Um, and that is on top of a 10% cut uh, last year and a 32% cut uh, in 0910. Um, again, just to go through some of the things that we eliminated back in 0910 and they continue today uh, is uh, any subscriptions, publications, memberships, uh, travel, training, education, recruitment expense, uh, professional services, et cetera. Although some budgets have a very small amount, um, for the most part, those were cut nearly 100%. Overtime is also very limited uh, on an only as needed basis. Um, reductions uh, affecting personnel, uh, all the way going back to the 0910 budget, uh, are no merit increases, no cost of living adjustments, no stability pay or tuition reimbursement. Uh, and each year, uh, as medical costs have risen, uh, the amount that our employees are paid in order to contribute toward those medical costs has remained the same. Uh, we also have implemented a uh, hiring freeze, um, although there, there has been uh, uh, one or two uh, individuals who have been called back from layoffs. Um, we have not actually done a recruitment in the past several years, um, and we intend to uh, continue to do that uh, until we get to a point that the budget is balanced with no use of reserves. There may, uh, in fact, based on tonight's action of the council, need to be uh, some adjustments uh, in, in our staffing and potentially um, the, the hiring of another director uh, to take over some of the duties that I was doing previously, but that's a discussion for another time, uh, not, not for tonight, because this budget was prepared based on known facts uh, from two weeks ago. Um, just to underscore the uh, reduction in work, workforce, 
Um, we, since, uh, uh, excuse me, July 1st of 2009, we have over 200 less employees than we had back then. Um, and we had a very significant uh, uh, reorganization or series of reorganizations that occurred that first year that we started making those dramatic cuts. Uh, and we uh, have another smaller reorganization that has occurred this fiscal year. Um, so we, we are cutting. Uh, I know in months past there have been public comment, uh, public comments made that we need to cut staff, we need to, to do those things. And I want to assure the council and the public that we in fact are doing those things. It's painful to do. And we also uh, implemented a furlough back in uh, 2009-10 uh, to where all employees are, are off every Friday and are not paid for it. It was a 10% furlough as well. So it effectively was over a two-year period a 10% uh, loss in pay as well. Um, additional appropriations that were not included in the proposed budget um, that have come up uh, effectively since uh, the, the budget was put together. There was a $92,000 uh, approval in closed session for some legal expenses uh, at the last meeting. Um, there's also an item on the agenda later for an additional appropriation of $151,000 for the golf course contract with Billy Casper Golf to close out this fiscal year. Um, and I do want to talk a little bit about that. Um, we, for this budget, um, we asked Billy Casper to uh, step up and produce a budget that had effectively no reliance on the general fund. Their original proposal had, uh, uh, from a year ago now, um, had effectively getting to break even on the golf course in about over about a five-year period. Uh, they haven't even been uh, operating the uh, Green Tree Golf Course for us for 12 months. Uh, it's been just shy of 12 months. And uh, we knew when we asked them to come up with a, effectively a zero budget that it would be difficult to do. Um, we hoped that they could get there, um, but uh, unfortunately, uh, they can't quite get there for next fiscal year. Um, and so something not to be considered at this time, but when that item comes up later, um, is to take a look at uh, the progress that they've made based on the original uh, budget, or excuse me, the original proposal that they had that it really didn't break even and start making money for the city until the sixth year. Uh, we're now looking at uh, a relatively small uh, contribution for next year, uh, next fiscal year, and then actually uh, going revenue positive the year after that. Um, I mentioned earlier that uh, you know, the, no one on city staff wants to close any of our recreational facilities. Um, I do want to draw a bit of a distinction to the golf course. I don't live on the golf course, but uh, the golf course uh, is a bit different than some of our other uh, recreational facilities in that it traverses significant neighborhoods throughout the city um, that uh, in order, if it were to close, it would end up being a blight and would actually be fairly costly to ever bring back. Um, we're hopeful that any sus suspension of the recreational facilities uh, that uh, may be necessary following tonight's meeting would be very temporary in nature. Uh, they would be easier to get back. And actually, um, the, a lot of the racquetball clubs have met with Mr. Gargan, who is on his way here now. He uh, was handling some city business uh, uh, outside of the city and is on his way here now. But he will be able to, later on when that item comes up, talk about some of those, uh, some of those meetings that he's had. We're hopeful that uh, ultimately we will be able to come to some kind of an agreement that uh, keeps those facilities open in some way. Um, the concern that we have, though, is that uh, what do we do if Ultimately, those facilities end up costing the city, say, thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars, and we just simply don't have the budget to to come up with that. So, I think uh, that the the folks that are here to support recreation are here, rightfully so, to do so, and I applaud them for the professional manner in which they approach the city um, in order to try to come up with uh, an innovative solution. Uh, and I'm hopeful that that will get there. Um, at the end of the day, uh, based on everything I've presented to you tonight, based on the budget proposal, as well as uh, some uh, some of the uh, additional expenditures discussed just, just now, uh, we are looking at having an estimated general fund reserve balance of about $300,000 in uh, one year from now at June 30, uh, 2012. Uh, that concludes the presentation. Uh, I am available for comment or qu to answer questions as are uh, the department heads, uh, a lot of their staff, as well as uh, my budget staff who helped me put this together. Uh, yes, Mr. Ostrom. Uh, just to comment on, 
Is this microphone? Just a comment on the on the um, golf course for a minute. Um, I don't know how many of you have been here when I don't know how many years ago it was. Uh, we did actually have a transition time there where the golf course was uh, privately owned, shut down for probably five to six, seven years, uh, and it went to dust. It went to desert. I mean, right snake through all of the neighborhoods and everything else. What an incredible blight and what an incredible impact, negative, I'm talking negative impact it was on the entire city. Not, not talking about any golfers or anything else, just the fact that having that golf course uh, go to desert uh, was an incredible loss. It took us millions of dollars to bring that up to the point where it is today, again, bringing it back through all those years. Uh, the iterations of the management and everything else has changed over that period of time. And to arrive at a point now where I have never heard anybody ever tell me that a municipal golf course would break even, let alone make any money for any city. It was, it's a loss leader in almost every community that has a municipal uh, golf course. Uh, and yet, uh, through all of this, uh, we're getting to a point now where that looks like it's going to, uh, it's making a little bit of money now, maybe uh, call it break even this year or, or next year, and then beginning to move into a more positive arrangement. Uh, so I think that we're on the right track here. But uh, for all the things that go through your head, don't ever consider uh, losing that golf course out there. Uh, it's, a, it's a valuable asset to this city whether you play golf or not. So just thought I'd share that with you a little bit. Okay, all of these uh, items are public hearing items, so I'm going to go ahead and open the public hearing on agenda items number 14, 15, 24, and 32. Uh, those are the all the budgets that are before the council and the various agencies that we represent for adoption. Um, I do have several cards. I'll start with Pastor Dane Davis. Brian, I think you missed item 17 as well. Oh, and item 17 as well. Thank you, Mayor McEachern. I think all of you have in your hand a proposal from the Youth Activities Association of Victorville. Uh, it's specific to the West Winds Sports Center, one of the recreational facilities slated to close the 1st of July. And uh, on the page two of, of the handout there, uh, just a, a quick summary of why the West Winds gym is so important. Services hundreds, probably would be more accurate to say thousands of uh, teens and adults uh, here in the Victor Valley. Uh, services also the businesses at SCLA, which I know is of paramount concern uh, to the city council. It's also a key component of the recreation hub there at SCLA. If the gym is closed, uh, we're confident there's going to be an increase in crime. You may not be aware, it was just within the past week, that one block from the West Wind Sports Center, there was severe vandalism to the former Shepherd Intermediate School. Uh, the portables were all broken into, bookshelves torn down, carpet ripped up, uh, computers stolen, just a block from that gym. And so one of the teachers was over at the church today, uh, right next to the gym, explaining the cleanup process. I have a a big concern about that. Also, there's concerns about obesity among childhood. We hear much about that recently. Closing a gym certainly doesn't help that. And uh, there's a very high probability, especially if there is some vandalism, that that gym realistically will never be reopened. As it currently stands, it's not in fantastic condition. Uh, add some vandalism to the mix, and you're talking uh, something that's completely cost prohibitive to reopen. I'd like you to go to page three, if you would, please. Uh, you'll be able to see the current budget. Uh, for that gym in particular, uh, as has already been mentioned uh, by Deputy City Manager Robertson, I have been in communication uh, with John Gargan over the last few weeks, and so these numbers are directly from him. Uh, if you look at the utilities and the first few line items uh, under cost, uh, bottom line is that facility right now is costing the city just over 105000 It's actually 105632 uh, per year to operate. You subtract from that second to last item, on the chart there is the income from fees. Uh, that's the $2 paid for use of racquetball, basketball, et cetera. You subtract that 32000 The current shortfall to the city is just over 73000 actually 73632 per year. Uh, column three, uh, what we are suggesting as an association, and uh, these are modest numbers. These are not pie-in-the-sky numbers. 
Uh, I sat down with uh, one of uh, the businesses the city has helped to solicit, uh, Kevin Mahaffey, the CEO of X Quadrum, that is now going to be uh, leasing a facility there uh, just to the side of the airstrip uh, for the aerospace company. Sat down, looked at these numbers today. Uh, what we are proposing is a reduction in utility costs, electricity being one of the greatest costs of that facility can easily be reduced. There's a swamp cooler, cooler unit being uh, cooling the main core of that building, the gym and the lobby. AC units are just for the racquetball courts. We could save 10000 a year by reducing that. Uh, work your way down to the fourth to last item building maintenance and then the third to last labor, we could reduce the cost by 50000 by transitioning over the next six months to completely volunteer labor, labor for manning that desk at the facility and also for taking care of the routine maintenance that's a part of that facility. So when all is said and done, uh, not even looking at uh, what's going to be presented here in just a moment about increasing revenue based on better promotion of the facilities, uh, increasing the number of leagues that are making use of facilities, use of the church. Pastor Porras is going to share in a moment about church rentals on Sundays, which is currently a closed day. Uh, without even looking at increased revenue, we within six months uh, believe, even looking at the numbers conservatively, that this could be cost neutral, uh, that it could be revenue neutral within six months. Uh, we just need some time. What we're proposing tonight is that the City Council allow us at least 60 days to demonstrate that we can significantly reduce costs to this facility and we can significantly increase revenue. And so in conclusion on the final page there, this is an important gem for the facility. Uh, it's an important uh, gem for the businesses at SCLA. Uh, and also uh, we just believe that because of these hard economic times, we realize, Council, that you don't want to see it close. We understand that city staff doesn't want to see it close. The community doesn't want to see it close. During these tough economic times, would you allow us to work with you to allow this gym to stay open and give us some time to demonstrate that we can make this cost neutral? And if it doesn't pan out in a few months, we'll understand if you need to close the doors or come up with another plan. But at least give us a chance. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor David. Reverend Raphael for us. Thank you, good evening, city mayor, city councils. Well, we continue with the same situation of Pastor Dan about West Wing. You know, we get enough bad publicity already for city of victory. We don't need no more bad publicity. We know we, we don't want to be in national news, you know, so we close that facility. Let's, uh, Mr. Mayor, see you can give you 60 days. You can, make a proposal or something to we can get 60 days to put in a head together. I think we can we can come with a budget. I'm willing to put in a thousand dollar donation every month to help with the situation there. Thank you. Thank you. Carlos Estrella. Mayor and council members, thank you for hearing me today. Um, I may uh, coach and player agent for Asbury National Junior Basketball Association. Um, they've been organized for the past three years, and I know the city of Victorville does have their Asbury NJB, and they run that out of uh, Victor Valley High School. Uh, we've been put with the burden on trying to obtain facilities for the children in order to uh, have practices and games at, and that's one of the biggest things. We've been going to many facilities inside Hesperia, area, and today I've been presented with the opportunity that we might have a chance to have practices at Westwinds to get the children to go there and practice. Um, it's definitely a, a plus for the children in the community, being teamwork, dedication, and uh, you know, just overall physical fitness for them, just like everybody has presented you here today. Um, but I just came up here today just to show you that there are hundreds of children that have the opportunity to possibly have practices here. And it's definitely, during these economic times, hard enough to uh, find facilities out there. Um, hopefully we can bring something to that facility, bring it alive again, as well as all the other members that are present there today and do play their recreations daily. Um, thank you for listening to me, and uh, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. For Mel Johnson. Um, thank you for having me, City Council uh, and Mayor. Uh, my name is Jamel Johnson. Uh, I'm a resident of uh, Victorville, California, but I'm originally from Cleveland, Ohio. It's, it was a city that was devastated in the in uh, the 70s. I left the area and I uh, joined the Marine Corps. In the Marine Corps, I retired after 20 years, and I came here to settle in at Victorville. 
Uh, when I settled in, I had a son uh, and, and two daughters. Um, and one of the things that I found that was missing was uh, I didn't have a chance to actually work with young people again. I found in the Marine Corps that that was part of my talent. It was part of my talent to help children. I found by being a coach in Victorville and West Wings, I found that most of the kids that were coming up there for me to coach as a basketball player didn't have a, a male role model at home. I'm going to tell you some numbers right now. I have 17 kids that are in college right now. One of them is my son who's going to be a doctor. That's right. He's going to be a doctor. He fought the odds. He broke, broke through, and he's doing it. All of his friends that played for me are going on to be something else. But I've got to tell you, city council, you better think long and hard. We talk about money. We should be talking about the youth of today. That youth is going to wind up in prison because they have no place to go. They have nothing to do. They will have nobody to turn to. So please take the time and think about what you're going to do here. By closing West Wings, um, it's just going to be a tragedy. Now, in closing, I, I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to drag this thing on. In closing, I told my son that it was going to close. He said, Dad, do what you can. He said, I love that gym. All my friends love that gym. It kept them out of trouble when they were seniors, juniors, sophomores. They didn't run the streets. I can't tell you what it means to the community, but I can tell you what it meant to me, to be a coach, to be a dad, to be a member of this community. It's tough, but being a volunteer, losing money on Saturday when I should be working, that was even tougher. Going to, going to practice after work, from 4 o'clock in the morning, working 16 hours a day. I work for the federal government. That's right. I work for the federal government. I'm an inspector. I'm a weapons inspector. That's right, a weapons inspector. I do your tanks, your, your machine guns, you name it. I do it all. And I put in long hours. I put in the hours because why? Because I love young people. I love the young people. I love the people here in Victorville. On behalf of that, for the people, the young people, I hope you guys can find the money. Find a way to keep those parks open. And remember, they will have no place to go. Thank you. Thank you. Eddie Fonseca. Mayor and City Council, my name is Eddie Fonseca, and um, I'm here regarding West Wing. And uh, my family uses, utilizes that facility. So as a young grandfather, I go and take my grandkids there. We play racquetball there, play basketball there. So it, it's hard to find a place where you can pay two bucks to take your family and, and, and enjoy the family time that that place provides. Uh, I've contacted Snapple. Dr. Pepper, they're one of the businesses that are there on the base, and unfortunately, they've already uh, budgeted their money. But a lot of times what they do is they, in the community, they'll go out and they'll set up playgrounds or sponsor different things. And um, like I said, unfortunately, they've already budgeted their money for uh, what they're going to do for this year. So I'm hoping that perhaps maybe for next year they could do something to help the facility. And so um, I just thought of, you know, perhaps another thing that we could do is perhaps the city could still be responsible and unlock the facility. We're more than willing to volunteer our time to keep the place up, to make sure that there isn't any vandalism going on. Uh, I've, one time I came here, I said, raise the fee, you know, whatever it takes, uh, you know, we could have tournaments. The, the place could be rented for parties, uh, but uh, I certainly wouldn't like to see it closed because we use it and it uh, being part of the community, you know, it's a place to go and for young people to uh, utilize. Thank you. Thank you. Jonathan Vanderloop. Members of the City Council and uh, fellow citizens of uh, Victorville and the area, 
Uh, I'm going to briefly uh, discuss a few of the uh, options and ideas we have for uh, increasing the usage and the ac activities and the uh, funds uh, generated by the West Winds. Some of the um, things we're looking at doing is uh, having challenge ladders, leagues, under 18, over 18, over 50, uh, youth programs, school programs, instruction in all of the sports available at West Winds, um, and tournaments, which you just mentioned, uh, in handball, racquetball, basketball, possibly volleyball, volleyball, badminton, unicycle, juggling, etc. And we have a number of people that are interested in working with children uh, to uh, do these programs with youth. In addition to that, we have uh, looked at the possibility of uh, generating uh, funds by uh, selling a membership of, uh, say, $30 a month. And uh, if we uh, sell 100 of those, um, we would be generating $3,000 a month, which is basically half of the uh, uh, loss the city is seeing right now. And to that end, I have talked to uh, almost 50 uh, users of the facility and asked them if uh, they would be willing to pay uh, $30 and donate a couple hours a month of uh, volunteer time uh, to keep the facility open. And to a T, no nobody's refused. Everybody said, uh, if that's what it takes to keep it open, we're willing to do it. So I'm sure I can find another 50 to make the 100. Um, another thing we're looking at is, um, besides uh, Reverend Porus coming to bat for us for a thousand dollars a month, we're looking at doing um, fundraisers and getting donations, etc. We've approached a number of people that are interested in doing that. If we can get the go ahead from you guys, um, and we're also um, looking at uh, increased revenue from all of these uh, additional activities that we have. And then we can also offer uh, youth uh, uh, memberships and family memberships also, because uh, a number of people have approached us now asking about family memberships. So this could be done uh, in the next few months if we get permission to go ahead with this project. So I want to thank everybody. Oh, one other point I want to make here is Right now, you have some volunteer systems for some of your uh, activities at the West Winds and other places in town here, such as uh, volleyball, uh, ping pong, uh, in the past, unicycle, pickleball, etc., where no city employees are involved in it at all. It's all done with volunteers. So all we're asking to do is to take that same concept and apply it to the racquetball and the basketball, because you're already doing the other things on that same basis. So if you look at it from that standpoint, we're coming to your rescue. You keep all these activities and all these kids busy where you don't have to pay for them and have an increase in juvenile delinquency. And having been at the juvenile detention center today, you really don't want to send these kids out there. I was in the max uh, department today. All these guys are in their 14 to 18 years. They're waiting to turn to 18 to go to the big house because they've all been convicted of attempted murder or murder and they got sentences anywhere from 10 to 30 years. So if we can prevent people from doing that and going that route, that is worth a lot of money and a lot of goodwill in the community. Thank you. Thank you. Susan Wells. My name is Susan Wells. I've been um, playing racquetball at Pebble Beach over 20 years. I don't think you realize that most of your constituents have no idea what's going on. I've been talking to the people at the park, played racquetball today, talking to the young mothers at the pool, the grandmothers. They have no idea that you're considering even closing this pool. Um, as far as I'm concerned, I'm not sure what you do to inform the public, but there's not much transparency here or information going out to the general populace. There's a lot of work to be done and a few workers as, as normal. Mr. Rothschild mentioned about closing of the golf course. What do you think is going to happen to the racquetball facility and the pool if you decide to close it? We're not in the best area over there. They're probably going to be vandalism, stealing, copper, or whatever they can get their hands on. Also, I was unaware that the tennis courts, many, many tennis players, and they don't pay anything to play tennis. I'm sure there can be some way that a fee could be charged to them also, besides just the racquetball players. 
I'm speaking again for the children of Victorville who have no public pool. You've already closed one down, and I just can't believe that you would close another one down. These people have no idea what you're doing. And one grandmother said to me, what do I do with my children next year? I said, why don't you come and ask the council that? There's no facilities for these children. These are the poor children of Victorville. They can't afford $69 a month over here at Spring Valley Lake. And before you make this unconscionable decision to close the pool, I would like you to think about the children, the people. There's other ways. What we talked about is memberships. There needs to be memberships for all, so I would say the tennis players, if they're using all the facilities without paying anything. I don't think you're thinking outside the box at all. All you're looking at, at dollars, dollars, dollars. The people, as far as I'm concerned, you don't care about. Many people say, Susan, why do you come up here and talk? Because they don't care. They don't care about the people here at all, this council. Well, I'm hoping that you do, and I hope that you take this to heart. Thank you. Okay, that is all the cards I have on our budget uh, public hearing items. Anyone else wishing to address the council on any of those items? All right, seeing no one else, I'll close the public hearing on uh, those agenda items and return it to the council for uh, comments and entertain motions and direction to staff. Well, I'd, I'll start off with one here. In um, 60 days, the, the committee that's being formed here, and uh, they've done a lot of due diligence on the West Wind activities, um, I would ask the council to uh, to budget that 60 days in. And not, not only that, but I'll... Whenever the meetings are, if somebody will notify me, I'll even show up at the meeting just just as a direct conduit back into the city council. So I'll, I'll come out there and, and do that too. Uh, I, I agree with the lady that said that the, you know uh, the site, unsightliness of the golf course dying on us and all the time. Exactly, it's as, maybe a smaller image of it, but the, exactly the same thing would happen out there. Uh, and once you lose that asset, it, it takes twice as much money to recover it. You say, wow, well, you know, two or three years later, we're saying, okay, we're, I think we can manage all this stuff now. By that time, it's going to cost you twice as much as it costs to save uh, over that same period of time. Uh, so for my part, at least if you need a council liaison uh, for the uh, CLA area out there, uh, anything, uh, any of the activities out there, I'll be happy to do that and come right back here and get in Doug's face or anybody else's uh, and let them know. These are the ideas that they're coming up. This is the things you need. These are the resources. Do we have them? Where we go find them? Um, I think um, collectively, uh, you're right. You, know, you We can um, probably save these programs. Uh, so... Uh, for my part, um, I'd like to see us uh, work in the, uh, uh, the savior of this uh, West Winds Activity Center and all of the uh, things that are going on out here and see what we can come up with in the next 60 days. I'm just going to add to that, Pastor, if you can get close to what you've done here, uh, we'll keep it open. There's, there's just no way we would close it if you can get anywhere close to this. And if, and if this approach will work at West Winds, it'll work at Pebble Beach Park. I mean, it's, it's the same concept. Uh, so I, you can count on us to back any effort you make in this area. Um, I, do, <laughs> I have to respond to the last comment. I, I, I can't imagine how anybody in this city thinks that we're up here, and we don't care. <laughs> this is the last thing in the world that I needed to do at this stage of my life. If you don't think I'd rather be at home with my wife and my grandkids rather than sitting up here and listening to the criticism that we get heaped with week after week when our, our problem that we just can't, we can't make it go away is the, is the decline in money. We've got to live with that. Now, knowing that, we can do all this other stuff. There's nothing we can't do. And, and volunteerism is a, is a wonderful answer. And we're going to back that to the hill. 
But, geez, criticize if you don't like the decision, but to suggest for a second that anybody sitting up here doesn't care about what we're doing and care about the people of Victorville, it's just, that's, uh, it's wrong. Well, I I, uh, I agree with uh, Mike Rothschild regarding the um, the recreation centers. I think it's amazing and it's touching to see the residents come together and find a solution to keep that open. I think that City Council, we owe it to you to make sure that um, you have a first shot at it. And um, I, I just I'm just sorry that um, you know we have to present such a sad budget. Um, due to the squandering of our tax dollars and not preparing for this day. So um, that's all I have to say. Well, I'll just echo all the comments of, of my colleagues up here. This presentation and, and the thought and preparation that you put into it is quite impressive. Uh, it looks somewhat like uh, what our staff does in putting together their PowerPoint presentations to present a budget to us and showing us how you can and, uh, make this break even. I think, uh, as they have stated, we owe it to you. I think, really, that was the direction that we sent staff in last time we had a workshop. Um, it's somewhat frustrating to me that that didn't get itself worked out prior to tonight, but it definitely deserves the additional 60 days. Um, I think we need to figure out how we do it. Uh, I'm, I'm just uh, overwhelmed at the numbers of people that showed up in support of Westwinds. It's quite, um, quite impressive uh, that you had such a showing. Um, I wish there were that showing for Pebble Beach Park, but I think that you all that are here for Westwinds ought to look to help those that use Pebble Beach Park to duplicate what you're doing out at Westwinds, because if we can do the same thing, over at Pebble Beach Park, we ought to be doing it there as well. So um, I think this is just uh, the start of something great. And uh, I think the council's direction here tonight is to give you that 60 days. Uh, hopefully, in that time frame, it can be worked out. And uh, uh, like Council Member Rothschild, I'd be willing to write letters to any and all tenants out at SCLA asking them to help and sponsor, um, you know, put my signature to those letters and and uh, make follow-up phone calls if it helps. Do whatever I can to help you raise money. Um, and hopefully with Pebble Beach Park, we can get uh, the business community throughout the rest of the city to step up with sponsorships and figure out ways that we can keep that facility open as well. So um, I think with that, we've we're pretty much... Yeah, let's, let's mention, I've seen a couple of chamber high power chamber folks sitting in this meeting tonight, <laughs> and I think this ought to be a you, project the chamber takes on. Well, I, I couldn't agree more. I would hope that the chamber would, would take this and run with it. Um, and other other civic organizations, Rotary, Kiwanis, um, you know, this is your time to shine. This is the opportunity to, you always give back to this community, um, and there's so much that you do, but here we're faced with the situation of closing two facilities that are so uh, important to our community and to the citizens of Victorville. So if the civic organizations as well as the Chambers of Commerce could step up and help uh, help not only the city of Victorville but all these volunteers make this work, uh, then it will show a real effort of our entire community coming together uh, to keep these facilities open. So um, with that, I think the direction to staff is, is to work, continue to work over the next 60 days uh, with uh, this group and perhaps others uh, to keep this, keep both uh, Westwinds and Pell Beach Park open. Um, but I would go ahead and move the adoption of the budget for all agencies as presented with that direction. Second. May I get a second? Was that Council Member Kennedy? He doesn't have the other. Oh, Motion by Mayor McEachern, second by Council Member Kennedy.
motion carries with council member Cabriales absent and council member Vias voting no. Mr. Mayor and Council, it's with pleasure that we'll make that adjustment to the budget uh, and finalize it. Okay, uh, we'll move on. Uh, we have under Southern California Logistics Airport Authority, agenda item number 16. This is a companion to City Council item number 40. This is a request to approve the memorandum of understanding by and between the Southern California Logistics Airport Authority and the City of Victorville and KD Affiliates LLC. Motion by Council Member Kennedy, second by Council Member Rothschild. Motion carries with Mayor Pro Tem Cabriales absent and Council Member Baez voting no. Okay, moving on to the redevelopment agency, uh, agenda item number 18 under written communications. This is a request to adopt resolution number 11-007 entitled the resolution of the Victorville Redevelopment Agency finding that the use of low and moderate income housing funds allocated from the Victorville Redevelopment Agency project areas for planning and general administrative costs is necessary for the purpose of producing, improving, and preserving the community's supply of low and moderate income housing. Motion by Council Member Rothschild, second by Council Member Kennedy. Motion carries with Mayor Pro Tem Cabriales absent and Council Member Vias voting no. Agenda item number 19 is a request to adopt resolution number R-11-008 entitled Resolution of the Victorville Redevelopment Agency Approving a Loan Agreement Buying Between Victorville Redevelopment Agency's Bear Valley Road Redevelopment Project Area and the Old Town Midtown Redevelopment Project. Motion by Council Member Rothschild, second by Council Member Kennedy. Motion carries with Mayor Pro Tem Caprialis absent and Council Member Vias voting no. Agenda item number 20 is request to adopt resolution number R-11-009 entitled Resolution of the Victorville Redevelopment Agency approving a loan agreement by and between the Victorville Redevelopment Agency on behalf of its Bear Valley Road project area to its portion of the Victor Valley Redevelopment Project area. Um, Mr. Mayor, just a question. Uh, Doug, correct me. These loan agreements we're approving are to document the loans that are in place? Uh, no, these are for new loans for, in order for to loans. Uh, okay. continue with the, the, uh, those operations uh, in the other redevelopment project areas. Okay. Motion by Council Member Rothschild, second by Council Member Kennedy. Motion carries with Mayor Pro Tem Cabriales absent and Council Member Baez voting no. Okay, I'm going to handle agenda items number 21, 23, 27, and 31 together as Council Member Baez is going to abstain from those. Uh, so we'll handle agenda item number 21 first. This is a companion, companion item to City Council item number 27. A continued public hearing called to hear arguments for and against the adoption of resolutions regarding water account liens and services where we will adopt resolution VWD-11-006, a resolution of the Board of Directors of the Victorville Water District establishing provisions relating to water account liens, and resolution number VWD-11-007 entitled a resolution of the Victorville Water District fixing rates for water service and recycled water service and adopting and facilitating unified policies for the administration of customer accounts associated with the billing and collection of rates, fees and charges for water and recycled water utility services. Uh, this is a public hearing. I will open the public hearing on agenda item number 21 under the Victorville Water District and agenda item number 27 under the City Council. Anyone wishing to address the Council on these items? All right, seeing no one, I'll close the public hearing and return it to the council for a decision. Motion by Council Member Kennedy, second by Council Member Rothschild. Motion carries with Mayor Pro Tem Cabriales absent and 
Council Member Vaya is absent. Okay, we'll move on to agenda item number 23, as well as City Council item number 31, uh, which is a companion item. Again, this is a continued public hearing called to hear arguments for and against adding delinquent non-paid charges to annual taxes levied upon the property and adopting resolution number VWD-11-011 entitled Resolution of the Victorville Water District, City of Victorville adding del delinquent non-paid charges to annual taxes levied upon the property for which the charges are delinquent and unpaid. This, oh, my apologies. This is a public hearing, so I'll open the public hearing on agenda items number 23 and under the Victorville Water District and 31 under the City Council. Anyone wishing to address the Council on those agenda items? All right, seeing no one, I'll close the public hearing and return to the Council for a decision. Motion by Council Member Rothschild, second by Council Member Kennedy. Councilmember Kennedy, may I get a vote from you? Sure. Motion carries with Mayor Pro Tem Cabrales and Councilmember Baez absent. Okay. Now we'll move into written communications under the Victorville Water District. Or I'm sorry, no. Yeah, agenda item number 22. Uh, this is a continued public hearing called to hear arguments for and against making determinations, uh, determination to fix, levy, and collect water standby assessments for the fiscal year 2010-2011 and adopt the following resolutions. Resolution number VWD-11-009 entitled, A Resolution of the Victorville Water District Making Its Determinations to Fix, Levy, and Collect Standby and Availability Charges for Water Improvement District Number 1 for fiscal year 2010-2011. Resolution number VWD-11-010 entitled A Resolution of the Victorville Water District Making Its Determinations to Fix, Levy, and Collect Standby and Availability Charges for Water Improvement District Number 2 for Fiscal Year 2010-2011. Again, this is a public hearing. I'll open the public hearing on agenda item number 22. Anyone wishing to address the Council on that item? Seeing no one, I'll close the public hearing and return to the Council for a decision. Motion by Council Member Kennedy, second by Council Member Rothschild. Motion carries with Mayor Pro Tem Cabriales absent and Council Member Baez voting no. Under agenda item number 25, under the Victorville Water District, uh, this is a request to approve the 2010 Urban Water Management Plan for Victorville Water District and adopt resolution number VWD 11-008 entitled a resolution of the Board of Directors of the Victorville Water District adopting the Victorville Water District 2010 Urban Water, Urban Water Management Plan. Motion by Council Member Kennedy, second by Council Member Rothschild. Motion carries with Mayor Pro Tem Cabrales absent. Agenda item number 26 is a request to approve the payment of annual replacement water assessment and lease of water rights in lieu of replacement in the amount of $2,176,814.90. Motion by Council Member Kennedy, second by Council Member Rothschild. Motion carries with Mayor Pro Tem Cabrales absent. Agenda item number 27 has been dealt with. So we'll move on to agenda item number 28. This is a continued public hearing called to hear arguments for and against the confirmation of annual assessments for the landscape maintenance assessment districts and adoption of the following resolutions. Resolution number 11-022 entitled, A Resolution of the City Council of the City of Victorville Confirming Annual Assessments for the Maintenance of Landscape Areas in the Citywide 1 Landscape Maintenance Assessment District Number 1 for Fiscal Year 2011-2012. 
B, Resolution Number 11-023, entitled Resolution of the City Council of the City of Victorville Confirming Annual Assessments for the Maintenance of Landscaped Areas in Eagle Ranch Landscape Maintenance Assessment District Number 2 for Fiscal Year 2011-2012. C, Resolution Number 11-024, entitled a Resolution of the City Council of the City of Victorville Confirming Annual Assessments for the Maintenance of Landscaped Areas in Brentwood Landscape Maintenance Assessment District Number 3 for Fiscal Year 2011-2012. Resolution number 11-025, entitled A Resolution of the City Council of the City of Victorville Confirming Annual Assessments for the Maintenance of Landscape Areas in Old Town Landscape Maintenance Assessment District Number 4 for Fiscal Year 2011-12. Resolution number 11-026, entitled A Resolution of the City Council of the City of Victorville Confirming Annual Assessments for the Maintenance of Landscape Areas in Vista Verde Landscape Maintenance Assessment District Number 5 for Fiscal Year 11-12. Resolution number 11-027 entitled a resolution of the City Council of the City of Victorville confirming annual assessments for the maintenance of landscape areas in citywide two landscape maintenance assessment district number six for fiscal year 11-12. Resolution 11-028 entitled A Resolution of the City Council of the City of Victorville Confirming Annual Assessments for the Maintenance of Landscape Areas in Talon Ranch Landscape Maintenance Assessment District Number 7 for fiscal year 11-12. And finally, resolution number 11-029, titled Resolution of the City Council of the City of Victorville Confirming Annual Assessments for the Maintenance of Landscape Areas in West Creek Landscape Maintenance Assessment District Number 8 for fiscal year 11-12. Again, this is a public hearing on agenda item number 28. I'll open the public hearing on this item. Anyone wishing to address the council on this? If you could come forward. This is, a, most of this is passing me in both lanes, okay? I have no idea what you guys are even talking about, but when that young lady was up here asking about the maintenance, is this, is this talking about hiring somebody that's local for doing this or what? What is this? No, and I'll, if I could have you speak to what the assessments are. Sure, these are actually uh, property tax assessments uh, that we have to do an annual uh, uh, resolution in order to keep them continuing. Um, it's not raising taxes, it's not lowering taxes, it's keeping taxes the same. Uh, but these are the uh, LMADs that she referred to, but this isn't the contract uh, in order to maintain them. This is in order to uh, receive monies from the citizens of Victorville who agreed to pay those uh, monies when they moved into those homes. And then those monies are used to enter into contracts or pay our own staff to, some, to maintain those uh, as needed. Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. But I've got to, and I, I mean, I'm going to vote for the assessment. Obviously, that doesn't have anything to do with the contract. But I have, I have a question about how we go out to bid on these, uh, on this as a collective package too. I mean, we've been doing it kind of almost automatic here for a number of years, and uh, I'd like at least to have it come back to the council. How do we do this? Uh, do we go out and, and get? Uh, uh, an open bid locally or anything else, or is there something else involved in that process? I'm a little bit at a loss. I know I understand the assessments and I understand how they work. I do not understand how we allocate uh, uh, the contract out to do the maintenance work on this. Could we, just, I thought could, those contracts were discussed in a November or December meeting. I remember being at that meeting, wasn't it? Is that everything the done in house? Is everything done in house, or do we? I didn't think so. I thought we had. I, I'd like to know a little bit more about that. Probably. Not tonight, because it's not a part of the motion. But it's a legitimate question. I'd like to know more about. Okay. If you'd like, I can respond to the question tonight, sure. or if you'd prefer, we can we can wait for another but day. It doesn't take too much time. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll be brief. Um, you know, the council um, authorized entering into um, uh, some short term, uh, on an hourly basis, uh, contracts. Uh, in order to maintain the LMADs through the remainder of, th of this fiscal year. And staff is working on a very, very, very comprehensive uh, map of all of our LMADs, including maintenance levels and uh, exact square footages, uh, so that we can do a more specific uh, contract uh, RFP process for that. Uh, at the uh, budget uh, meeting that we had two months ago, um, the council also directed staff to, to at least let RFPs 
for a number of other services, and I believe that we have seven or eight that are in the final development stages. Uh, I would imagine that three or four of those are probably going to end up going out uh, within a week or so, and the other four we're just waiting on on finalizing the the actual uh, um, technical specifications as to exactly what what we're expecting from those RFPs. So those will be on the street very soon. Um, Elm, I'm not sure exactly where the LMAD is in in those uh, in the, that group of RFPs, but uh, we heard you loud and clear, cool. and we are definitely proceeding with that. All right, the public hearing is still open. Anyone else wishing to address the council on this item? All right, seeing no one, I'll close the public hearing and return it to the council. Motion by Council Member Rothschild, second by Council Member Kennedy. Motion carries with Mayor Pro Tem Cabrales absent. Agenda item number 29 is a continued public hearing called to hear arguments for and against the confirmation of annual assessments for the drainage facilities, assessment districts, and adoption of the following resolutions. Resolution number 11-030 entitled, A Resolution of the City Council of the City of Victorville confirming annual assessments for the maintenance of drainage and landscape areas in the citywide drainage facilities assessment district number one for fiscal year 2011-2012. Uh, resolution 11-031 uh, dealing with assessment district number two in the Vista Verde uh, drainage uh, for 11-12 and resolution 11-032 uh, dealing with the West Creek drainage facilities a district number three for uh, fiscal year 11-12. This is a public hearing. I'll open the public hearing on agenda item number 29. Anyone wishing to address the council on that item? Seeing no one, I'll close the public hearing and return it to the council. Motion by Council Member Rothschild, second by Council Member Kennedy. Motion carries with Mayor Pro Tem Cabrales absent. Agenda item number 30, another continuing public hearing called to hear arguments for and against the confirmation of annual assessments for maintenance assessment districts number one and two in adoption of the following resolution, resolution number 11-033, uh, which is a resolution of the City Council of the City of Victorville confirming annual assessments for the maintenance of park and landscape areas in the Las Haciendas maintenance assessment district number one for fiscal year 11-12 and resolution 11-034 entitled Resolution of City Council of City of Victorville confirming annual assessments for the maintenance of park and landscape areas in the Vista del Valle uh, Maintenance Assessment District number two for fiscal year 11-12. This is a continued public hearing. I'll open the uh, public uh, hearing on agenda item number 30. Anyone wishing to address the council on that item? Seeing no one, I'll close the public hearing on agenda item number 30 and return it to the council. Motion by Council Member Kennedy, second by Council Member Rothschild. Motion carries with Mayor Pro Tem Cabrales absent. Next item on our uh, agenda is the consent calendar. Motion by Council Member Kennedy, second by Council Member Rothschild. Motion carries with Mayor Pro Tem Cabrales absent and Council Member Vias voting no. Moving on to agenda item number 34 under written communications. Uh, this is a request to approve the proposed settlement agreement for the litigation case regarding the City of Victorville versus Nunez. CIVVS 802634 in the amount of $560,000. Motion by Council Member Rothschild, second by Council Member Kennedy. Motion carries with Mayor Pro Tem Cabrales absent and Council Member Vias voting no. Agenda item number 35 is a request to ratify the expenditure plan for the 2011 Burn Justice Assistant Grant JAG allocation and authorize the city manager or his designee to process all documents required for the program administration. Motion by Council Member Kennedy, second by Council Member Rothschild.
Motion carries with Mayor Pro Tem Cabrales absent. Agenda item number 36 is request to adopt resolution number 11-038 entitled Resolution of the City Council of the City of Victorville approving the application for statewide park program grant funds. Motion by Council Member Rothschild, second by Council Member Kennedy. Motion carries with Mayor Pro Tem Cabrales absent. I think there's going to be any money in that? <laughs> Agenda item number 37 is a request to award a contract to VCI Telecom for the construction of Innovation Way Roadway at SCLA in the amount of $1,647,785.77. Motion by Council Member Rothschild, second by Council Member Kennedy. Motion carries with Mayor Pro Tem Cabrales absent and Council Member Vias voting no. Agenda item number 38 is request to amend the service provider agreement with Parsons, uh, Brickenhoff, Quaid, and Douglas, Inc. for added construction support engineering and environmental services and increase the not to exceed amount by $750,000 to cover the fiscal year 11-12 and fiscal year 12-13. Motion by Council Member Rothschild, second by Council Member Kennedy. Motion carries with Mayor Pro Tem Cabrales absent and Council Member Vias voting no. Agenda item number 39 is request to approve the execution of a master confirmation agreement with Constellation Energy Commodities Group, Inc., subject to final changes deemed necessary by the city manager and the city attorney. Motion by Council Member Rothschild, second by Council Member Kennedy. Motion carries with Mayor Pro Tem Cabrales absent and Council Member Vias voting no. Agenda item number 40 has been dealt with. We'll move on to agenda item number 41. This is a presentation of requests to approve the immediate closure of Westwinds Golf Course and appropriation of $151,000 for fiscal year 11 12, pursuant to information provided by Billy Casper Golf. Motion by Council Member Kennedy, second by Mayor McEachran. I have a question. Are we going to get a presentation? Doug, were you going to provide an additional presentation? Um, I yeah. went over it mostly in the budget. Um, there is an updated pro forma um, that is a change from what uh, they Billy Casper sent to us as part of the RFP process from one year ago. Um, at this point, actually, I'll ask uh, Mr. John Gargan to uh, come up and give uh, the remainder of the presentation on uh, what uh, what changes we might be looking at here. Council, uh, it had been, at the onset of the management contract with Billy Casper Golf, it was the intention of both parties to try to keep Westwinds and Golf Course or reopen it and keep it running at the same time as um, Green Tree. But with the fact that it had been closed for close to a year and it took another, you know, three months to, to get it operational and the continued downturn in the economy, it has become quite evident that we cannot continue to, to uh, support both golf courses. The, it's, it's just not there. The play isn't there. So that's why the recommendation to close Westlands down immediately um, so we can, um, you know, st stop the, the bleeding there. Um, as far as the appropriations for Green Tree, and due to the fact that uh, there was the change uh, of closing Westwinds down, as well as their assumption here in a few months of the of the uh, food and beverage operation at Green Tree, uh, they were not able to get the numbers to us in time for the budget um, submittal. And so this is their their portion uh, of that um, budget sum submittal. Uh, this year's uh, budget for the courses was over 800,000. They're, they're, they're asking for 151,000 for next year. So you can see that they are whittling away at it. And if you saw the performa, uh, originally uh, after 2015, they were showing a loss at Green Tree, accumulated loss for all, for the first five years. 
of um, over $800,000. And now at the end of 2015, we're looking at a surplus of $332,000. So we're looking at a turnaround of over $1.1 million um, since uh, now that they've, they've got their feet on the ground and operations are going and uh, they're doing what we hired them to do. So uh, that's, that's the situation right now. So I understand. When we're talking about the West Winds Golf Course. Clo closing down, yes. Closing down. That has nothing to do with closing down the recreation part of it. No, no. It has nothing it's to do with it. It's a complete, complete separate item. Okay. John, the 151 is for? It's for green, the, uh, green tree operations. Green tree. All right. And, and, it, and if you notice in the past, that's always been probably close to a million dollars. It was being subsidized. Um, they were able to cut all, we probably cut about 500,000 out of the budget this past year with their operations, and now they're going to be able to cut an additional um, 700 or so thousand out of that this upcoming year. And, and like I said, at the end of 2015, the operations will be able to start paying back the general fund that's been subsidized. This over amount years. should have been in the budget. They didn't get it to us in time. Correct. So this is kind of an. Correct. Addendum to the budget. Correct. Right. The reason I hesitated actually was I wanted to ask you about the driving range. Is that could that be a revenue ongoing revenue thing even if we close down the the golf course? You're still well, you're, you're going to have maintenance. You're going to have water uh, mowing but on the driving range. On the driving range, you still have water the grass or the grass to be out there. You have to you have to and mow it and then either you either have to automate it with a, a ball machine, um, but then you're you're still having electricity to have to be turned on to run to run the machine all right. and fill it and do all those types of things. So it's, right now it's it's, I got you. it's not feasible. I got you. I got you. So the West, Council, oh, sorry. The sorry, West Wind golfers can still go to the grumpy golfer. The the one over here. Yes. Okay. Once we close this one down, yes. they still have another one, which is the grumpy Yes, the, member, the memberships are good at both courses. Okay, got it. And, and just for the Mayor and Council's uh, information, I, there are two members of uh, Billy Casper Golf here tonight. I know they're willing to answer questions uh, if you have any of them. Um, and additionally, I've been in discussions with them about uh, some concepts that they have to potentially add a driving range to the Green Tree Golf Course. Um, it would make it would take some modifications to uh, hole number 18, and it would take a bit of an infusement of cash, uh, but ultimately over a, a multi-year period, we believe that it would pay for itself not only through uh, the use of, of the driving range, but also perhaps an increased use of the golf course having the driving range there uh, uh, and available. So that's something we'll be looking at over the next few months to see if we can come up with a way to make that happen and, and get Green Tree back on its feet and, and revenue positive even even more and more quickly. Uh, I did want to mention to them, and I see them out in the audience and I'm putting them on the spot, um, that uh, I, I have made it very clear exactly where we are from a budget standpoint. You know, our first year we had to make some adjustments. They know everything they need to know now. They are professionals. They manage over 100 golf courses, um, and they are successful at it. And they, I've made it painfully clear to them that they can't come back in August, September, December, March and say, hey, gosh, we need more money, because it's just not there. And I want the council to be assured that uh, that we're going to make it work for this budget amount. And, and that's the discussion that we've had with, with Billy Casper, and they're committed to that. Motion carries with Mayor Pro Tem Cabrales absent. And item number 42 is request to ratify first amendment to city manager agreement. Motion by Council Member Kennedy, second by Council Member Rothschild. Motion carries with Mayor Pro Tem Cabrales absent. Agenda item number 43 is a request for the mayor to send follow-up letter to Best Best and Krieger regarding possible conflict of interest. This was requested at the uh, or at the request of Councilmember Rothschild. Uh, obviously, I left off the most important person. I, I think that's appropriate for the mayor to send out a letter saying, "Let's mention uh, the attorney left off." The, I forgot his name. <laughs> 
So I, I'm, a, I'm asking that uh, you um, follow up that letter, because that, that letter was totally unsatisfactory. It was cover your legal butt type of letter. Motion by Council Member Rothschild, second by Council Member Kennedy. Motion carries with Mayor McEachran voting no and Mayor Kim Cabrales absent. Item number 44 is request for direction to the VITA representative to seek an independent audit of the expenditures by the individual Victor Valley Economic Development Authority VITA member agencies. I would ask that we table that at this time. Pull it off the agenda. Have to be re. re uh, uh, Are you asking for a uh, continuation or just for it to be pulled all together? At this time, I'll ask for it to be pulled completely. If I, if we want to re or if I want to re-agendize it, I'll bring it up in the proper sequence and, and do, go through the formalities again. But at this time, I'll, I'll ask to uh, pull it. Just simply ask that the VITA members do uh, put out their an annual report clearly to the Victor Valley and uh, as to the expenditures of each of the uh, members. Okay, with uh, no motion there, uh, agenda item number 45, uh, discussion possible action regarding formation of partnership with volunteers for maintenance of recreational facilities. Doug, is this what we've given you This was, I think, covered in the budget pretty well. Um, I, I would like, and we don't need direction on this, actually, I would like to comment that uh, staff uh, attempted to uh, to build some volunteerism uh, within the city. Uh, I think it was a year ago or maybe two years ago now. Um, and it didn't didn't work very well. Um, you know, we did a little bit of advertising of it, and uh, I'm encouraged to see the level of volunteerism that we saw on the one recreational facility. Uh, and in fact, I would like to try to use that as a model for other facilities that we may uh, either at this time or in the future need to to look at closing, just because they they are costing more money than 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 we can afford. Um, so I'm I'm hopeful in that. Uh, and, but uh, as far as this item, I don't think that there's any need for further discussion because you've given clear direction. Okay. Then we'll move on to agenda item number 46. This is a request to delegate two council members to attend future planning commission workshops being scheduled for the purpose of reviewing and making recommendations regarding development trends and planning policy. Uh, are there any council members that would like to volunteer for this? Wow. <laughs> um, well, I know uh, Mayor Pro Tem uh, Cabriales had uh, expressed interest in this. Um, and if there's no other interest, I will uh, serve on this since I had served on the Planning Commission for eight years before coming on to the council, if that's uh, the desire of this council. I agree. <laughs> I work full time. Yeah, I, kn I know. <laughs> well, I. <laughs> no, I. I appreciate that. I think the meetings are after hours, right, Bill? Where are you? <laughs> He's gone. Anyway. Um, okay, well, then I'll make that motion that myself and uh, Mayor Pro Tem Rudy Cabriol serve on, on, on as the two council members. Motion by Mayor McEachran, second by Council Member Kennedy. Motion carries with Mayor Pro Tem Cabriolis absent. Okay, moving on to council reports, uh, discussion and possible action regarding items for the upcoming city council agenda, and I'll start with Councilwoman Bias. Um, I did see that email, and I went to make sure if we could get the noise ordinance on the agenda for next time. Okay, yeah, I know um, we did get an update on that today via email. Will we be able to get it on the next agenda? We wouldn't be able to get it on the next agenda because we have to advertise for a period of 10 days. So this, by the second meeting in July, possibly we will have it on yeah. there. I know that's being actively worked on, and I copied you on for that reason. Mm -hmm. So that's why I wanted you to hear that, April, that that's coming back before. Well, when we have we adopt an ordinance, we have to legally advertise that we're going to have a public hearing on that ordinance for 10 days. So that's that's all we're going to be doing. But uh, that will be coming back. What's our second meeting in July? Uh, 
uh, that would be... 19th? By 19th, yes. Okay. So be on the lookout for that. And any other items? Council reports, I do. Oh, okay. Um, all right, Council Member Kennedy. Um, yeah, I had asked uh, Keith Messler about uh, getting an agenda item for the discussion of the sterling contract, but I think that's probably on schedule for sometime in July. Okay. I know they're, they're going to need time to have put it all together, but it's in the works. Okay. Councilman Rothschild? Yes, I wanted to comment on a letter that we got from Supervisor Metzenfeld today, uh, later this, late this afternoon, as a matter of fact. As uh, some of you may know, I uh, opposed the sandbag agreement to build Nisqually, not because sandbag or Caltrans doesn't build a good bridge. It, the devil was in the details of the contract. I didn't want us to obligate our local measure I. There's a regional measure I that I was hoping Sandbag could have done that. They didn't. There was other aspects of that agreement, but for the most part, that was the one that, that, that bothered me the most. When the council voted 3-2 to agree with the sandbag agreement, then I went ahead in the follow-up uh, motion uh, the next uh, two weeks and agreed along with the rest of the majority of council since that was our policy to move ahead with that construction. Then today we get a letter from the supervisor, and in my opinion, he is threatening the city and everything else with uh, this comment uh, about the uh, issues that we have with the uh, billboards on the freeway, and he's threatening our Nisqually project with that. Uh, in there. To me, this is unconscionable. I cannot believe any supervisor would entrain in that. He's even said uh, uh, that uh, I know it's not normally a uh, way in on city uh, policies and prerogatives. He had no business way, weighing in on this, not to mention the fact that it's an active litigation issue. So uh, to me, uh, this again reinforces the idea that I don't want Sandbag doing this project again, and, and I know the council had voted for it. And I would ask that we agendize for the next uh, council meeting uh, to consider a reconsideration of that contract. And I asked the attorney if that was possible once we get into this. And it is possible to go ahead and stop that contract and go back the way we had it before, where we would do our own work. We have, all of our city engineers are teed up for this in the first place. Uh, so I would ask that uh, the council approve agendizing uh, reconsideration of the sandbag contract to build a squally energy. This is incredible. Uh, this threat uh, to the city uh, over something that is totally parochial to us has nothing to do with the, the squally interchange, and he's threatening us. But what else are they going to do along the next two or three years of, of this construction project? This is, un this is beyond, beyond the pale. So that's my motion. Oh, wait a minute. That's for the other, the other item, right? You're asking for that to be agenda. Yeah, that's the next item. That's my comments from the letter, and then my motion will be on the next item. Well, I'll say I absolutely agree with your take on the letter, but I'm absolutely opposed to re-agendizing the, the uh, project. I am as well. Okay, I'm good. All right, any other items uh, that you want to add, um, Councilmember Rothschild? No, that's, um, I, I just okay. wanted that agenda. It's, uh, to me, it's, we don't need that contract. Uh, um, this is a, another threat, and there will be another one after that following it. So uh, I don't know. That, that's super, your supervisor that's doing this. Uh, I can go through a whole arms list of things that he's done to uh, injure the city of Victorville, and I don't know why. I got, haven't got a clue. Uh, but when he's up for re-election, I assure you, uh, I'll be one of them standing out there making that list very evident, self-evident to the rest of the community, uh, what's going on. But he's not representing the city of Victorville that much, I can assure you. All right. Uh, anything else to add under council member reports? Mr. Rothschild? No. No. Mr. Kennedy? No. Okay. Um... I would like to uh, express my disappointment in um, appointing uh, Doug Robertson to the city manager's position. I feel that the city owes it to the people to recruit, not only to be an equal opportunity employer, but the management that we've had over the past several years have helped get us into where we're at. They make the recommendations to the city council for us to approve. 
we rely on the information that is presented here at City Council. Now, I wasn't on Council for the last few years, just got on, but from my experience with the management and the leadership here, I have not received accurate information. I'm not pleased with the budget. I feel that it's omitting pertinent information as, as far as cash flow balances. On funds, on fund bases, simple information that I've asked for, I know a lot of you have read the letters that I've, I've put out for, for the city, and I still don't receive the information. And I would like to support these recommendations that are coming before us. And, and you can see that I vote no, 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 almost on a consistent basis. And I feel that I owe you uh, an explanation, but not one every single time. Otherwise, we would be here past midnight. But understand and know that I'm not comfortable with the competence level of our management and our leadership here at the city. And I'm not comfortable in history repeating itself. So when you see those no, no votes, know that I have read it. I do understand. But until we get competent management, I don't feel comfortable voting yes on many of the projects. And I'm going to vote yes on things like public safety and bare, bare necessities that we need. Um, with our tax dollars, but all of this SCLA, I hope that the that the cities that Brad Metzen felt they figure it out that we can't even get our own business together here. They need to either take over SCLA um, or it needs to be regional or go private. But we have proven a proven track record of failure. We can't even the city council won't even listen to. The auditors, when they say that we're going to be insolvent, they don't want to bring in a consultant to see whether or not we're going to file bankruptcy. And what am I left to do? I'm one vote. I have no choice. Maybe I, I need to go to the state auditor controller and ask them, what can we do? Or, do we need to file bankruptcy? What is happening to our city? I, we keep spending money like there's no tomorrow. And I know there's no money, and we keep getting further and further into debt, and we keep funding projects that have no funding source, just hoping that the economy is going to recover. And I can't make decisions like that. So I felt that I owed it to the people to explain why I'm voting no. OK. Um, under uh, items to add to the agenda, I think that uh, one of the items that I uh, wanted to add was Councilmember Baez is uh, consistently asked to recuse herself by our city attorney on items that are somewhat related to uh, sewer and water. And um, I'd like the council to agendize on its next uh, agenda that she only needs to recuse herself on items that deal with VVWRA directly. Um, I think that we're overstepping here. And it's, it's getting to a point where it doesn't make any sense. So. I, I'd like to at least have the council have that discussion on whether or not she really needs to recuse herself on those items that are not directly re related to VBWA. Do you want to address that briefly right now? I mean, ultimately, it would be incumbent upon the council member to make that decision. It's a common law bias potential and a perception of bias, and I can't recommend that she not recuse herself on those issues. I think it's appropriate if she's got any question or doubt that she recuse herself just to avoid any appearance of bias. FPPC has ruled on it, and they don't find any conflict of interest, but that's only under FPPC analysis. Uh, for common law bias issues and conflicts of interest, it goes down to AG interpretations. They're very fact-specific, and ultimately she'd be the person suffering the consequences if she was deemed to have a conflict. I'm not in favor of agendizing that because I don't think I'm qualified to make that judgment as a council member. That It is her call to make. And with advice of counsel, it's well, not for us to decide on. You know, I, and I appreciate that Ryan brings it up, because a lot of times when I do leave the room, I feel like I'm taking the easy way out, or people are going to think that I am. But I want to make sure that even if it's the FPPC, I, I pushed to get this legal opinion, and it came back that I work at a sewer plant. I make the same amount of money no matter how many people flush their toilets. So there's no real bias or conflict there that they ruled. 
But then the attorney brings this other thing that, you know, it, that could go to a higher authority, the attorney general, and it has to be specific. And I just, you know, I, I feel bad stepping out of the room because I think, you know, there may, may come a time where I need to be in here for the people, and I can't or I won't. But I guess at that time I'd be willing to suffer the consequences if just so that the people know that if it came down to that, I would be willing to suffer the consequences if it meant that I was doing the right thing for the people. But in the meantime, for perception alone, I'll step out of the room. Okay, so then I guess we don't need to agendize it, but I, I wanted to at least uh, bring that up because I know that uh, you've expressed some frustration with respect to that. Um, with respect to comments made regarding the competency of our management and staff, um, you know, we're, we're in some difficult times, we're in some difficult situations, and we could not afford to have someone come in and take 12 to 24 months to get up to speed on all those issues that we have before us. And I think the council made the right decision tonight in, mo in moving forward with Doug Robertson. Um, perhaps once we get all these issues behind us and Doug decides to move on, maybe we'll be in a position um, to, to go out and bring someone new in. But uh, for at least my part, I think uh, what the council did here tonight uh, was the appropriate move. And I just would like to congratulate uh, Mr. Robertson uh, as he'll be taking his new role come July 1st. So that's all I have. With that, we are adjourned.